Yo, 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 hello everybody, what's up? In case you're listening for the first time, this is not how I normally talk. Uh, I'm just doing these little shenanigans right now. Shenanigans. Uh, <laughs> hello everybody and welcome, this is the Apostate Prophet. I hope you're having a fantastic day. We are 14 minutes late, which is primarily because uh, David Wood was taking his sweet time and letting me wait here together with uh, everybody else. And I told him, I told him this time, David, I've had enough of this. If you keep coming late, I will not have you on my channel anymore. Uh, I, I was three minutes late in my defense. It was because I just finished recording an awesome video. I have no idea why this guy asked me to respond to a certain passage of the Quran, but a Muslim friend did. So, why don't you respond to this? Okay. Okay. So uh, <laughs> just wreaked all kinds of havoc on the Quran. But then I was only three minutes late. And I, I look and I see, I see we're 12 minutes past that. It's almost like uh, someone couldn't get his mic to work and all that stuff. Yeah. Come on. It's just, don't, don't blame it on me. It, it's funny because I see people, uh, David's building up the suspense for this response. It's like, I haven't even watched it yet. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't even watched the clip. You said we you said we could actually watch it right here and stuff. Yeah. So it's like reaction to it and stuff. So, you know, that's the funny thing. Uh, we talked about it uh, behind the scenes. We thought we would actually do this on a different day. No, we, we were planning on doing this on Friday, I believe. Mm -hmm. Then we dropped it because of some developments. And then today we decided, hey, let's just do it. And uh, the preparation is not as we originally planned it, but we want to be spontaneous. And uh, yeah, I was, at, I was I was at I was at I was at the playground with my wife and Kepler. And you're like, hey, you want to go live? Like, eh, all right, let's do it. Yeah, that's how I am. That's how I am. I disrupt all your private plans by the way very moves said made a super chat and said david you mentioned in a different different stream rumble is worse than youtube this is the first i've heard this would you elaborate a little um no not right here because we do want to get to our show i will i will make a video out of that uh about that either this coming week or the following week just because so many people are asking what what i uh what i meant and, and what i mean there is rumble may be better for certain things like if if people want to complain about COVID or something like that. And Rumble has, you know, doesn't ban you as quickly as something like YouTube would or something like that. For stuff that we do, it's actually worse. It's actually worse than YouTube. I'll I'll, I'll explain that in a, in a video sometime. That is, that sounds very funny. So today what we'd want to do is uh, we want to look at this, uh, this, this podcast episode uh, on the Michaela Peterson podcast, which came out a few days ago, uh, on which Mohammed Hijab and Ayan Hirsi Ali are on opposing sides. And the podcast is, the podcast is called Opposing Views. So uh, she asks Mohammed Hijab questions and asks Ayan Hirsi Ali questions. There is a great contrast that you will be able to see in the responses and the conduct of these two people, uh, how one compares to the other. And uh, this is also something that happens after after that happened after Mohammed Hijab um, you know, appeared on the uh, on Jordan Peterson's podcast, which I criticized very harshly because I because I thought it was very lacking, and Jordan Peterson didn't say, uh, you know, didn't go into very important stuff. Uh, Michaela asked some really good questions, and obviously she doesn't know very much about Islam, but I think that she got a very good impression. Uh, from the Muslim apologists who are here to represent Islam, so we want uh, to talk about that. I'm, I'm, I'm guessing. Maybe I'm a prophet here, but I'm, I'm guessing that Hijab was like a major jerk and really uh, hostile towards Ayan Hirsi Ali, right? You could say that, yes. So a you woman who, uh, you know, uh, fled her country and had to deal with uh, female genital mutilation, all this other stuff, and then they repeatedly, they wanted to kill her where she was, and so she got out of there. Uh, one of her friends who helped her make that short film, uh, Theo Van Gogh, he got brutally murdered and almost completely beheaded in broad daylight. And so that's that's her life with Islam. And then let me guess, Muhammad Hijab, I'll show you to disagree with us. We'll show you not to mess with us. Ha -ha. I'm about right. That is about right. It also shows a complete lack of, uh, you know, sensitivity of of reading the room and uh, 
whatever you know is responding accordingly i mean he is uh talking to somebody who went through hell if i can say that on her journey uh and and witnessed the direct you know the murder of a person of her friend with whom she made a movie and the murderer even said ayan her cle is next or something like that or she should be uh, something like along those lines and and then here comes this brave big muslim apologist and yeah. just uh, gives such a big conduct but, but we will see that we will we will get to that it will be uh very very telling before we start i want to ask everyone a question which i will ask again when we are halfway through the podcasts or so uh please guess everybody what do you think how much uh are muslims in general as you would think or most muslims who have seen this podcast proud of muhammad hijab's representation of islam or not what do you think what is your guess i would like to, i will ask you that question again just so that you can uh you know test yourself and your uh understanding of the muslim community alhamdulillah our <laughs> hero our savior he's going to save us from the avalanche of apostasy <laughs> if we just get him on enough podcasts yeah it's okay so you gotta love this religion man it's, <laughs> it's hilarious right there's what, there's nothing you could watch that is more entertaining than this what a religion <laughs> uh is islam in can anybody can everybody tell me if this if you can hear it completely misogynistic i hear it the answer to that unfortunately is a clear cut yes if someone wants to quote aspects of the islamic discourse aspects of the Islamic uh, jurisprudential tradition and juxtapose it with the Western discourses, especially here, we're talking about second wave feminism and expect Islam to correspond with those. They'll be utterly and bitterly disappointed because clearly. Okay. Uh, everyone can quickly let me know if the, the audience is uh, well balanced and everything. If so, they can then, if so, then we will proceed. I'm playing it with uh, a little bit higher speed. Excuse that. We believe our system is superior. <laughs> to two sides of I, contentious I hope the music was not a problem. And I had tried to say 140. Seems superior. See, yeah, I'm going through it again. It's funny. Welcome to episode 140 of the Michaela Peterson podcast. I'm Michaela Peterson. This episode was intense, to say the least. It's an opposing views on Islam. I had Muhammad Hijab on one side, an author and philosopher interested in political philosophy and comparative religion, and I had the pleasure of speaking to Ayan Hirsi Ali, an author, scholar, and former politician best known for her activism against women's treatment in Islam. I'm incredibly honored to be able to host these kind of conversations and to be able to speak to two sides of contentious subjects. I'm never happy when one side goes after the other side and attacks them personally rather than attacking their ideas. <laughs> I left this opposing news kind of freaked out and fairly aggravated, to be honest, but I haven't edited anything because I think it's best to show what and how everyone said. Oh, so this is after. Regardless of how uncomfortable it was. If you enjoy this content or learn something, please consider subscribing. Before we jump into a somewhat stressful podcast, this episode was brought to you by NordVP. Okay, so she wants to go into advertisements, but... Uh... There are already a few things that need to be said, I mean, and I'm sure you have caught them already. <laughs> they... It doesn't doesn't first of all it does not sound like she's happy with uh, uh, or impressed with hijab. Sounds more like I'm reluctantly posting this, um, just you know because these guys are uh, her and and Jordan and so on are uh, have a really high value of the importance of representing people accurately and freedom of speech and things like that. But it sounds like hey man this is really bad but i'm gonna post it anyway yeah i mean notice the the wording that she uses uh i would even like to play that again but she said uh i left this podcast kind of uh freaked out and aggravated but i wanted to publish it anyway you know without editing without leaving anything out because i want them to represent themselves as they are so this is what this is her impression of this episode i le i left this podcast aggra uh freaked out and aggravated but i left it unedited anyway and publish it and I, I really want to say something here at this point i mean there are lots of muslims who think who think muhammad hijab did something great for islam here you hear the words of the host and the impressions that she had from this episode. She's freaked out, freaked out. The wording is freaked out and aggravated, but she wanted to publish it anyway because she wants to represent them 
as they represented themselves. Is mm. this really what people are proud of? <laughs> yeah, and no, I mean, think about th this is, I mean, my goodness, AP, this is this is why we love Muhammad Hijab. And AP, you and I, you and I talk on the phone. So you bear witness right here. <laughs> you 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 could you could bear witness when when we're talking on the phone and you say, Hey, Muhammad Hijab was just on a podcast with so and so. Do I go, oh no, he was on, or do I go, oh, this is awesome? <laughs> <laughs> I remember our first call where I told you, hey, uh, Muhammad Hijab was on the Jordan Peterson podcast, and, and your reaction was <laughs> great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, and because I mean, I mean, think about this, right? It would have been very easy to get Ayan Hirsi Ali on there with some very, very nice, sweet-talking Muslim like Shabir Ali or someone like that, who would who would be very, very friendly, who would come across as very nice, in fact, would come across nicer than Ayan Hirsi Ali does. And then the impression uh, that, that someone would get for, I mean, I'm sure a lot of her audience does not know much about Islam, except for, you know, what they hear from, from terrorist attacks and so on. Um, the impression that they would get from watching like a Shabir Ali type would be, wow, we were right. It's it's just those radicals out there. And oh yeah, everyone has their radicals and extremists and so on. So, so wow, yeah, thank you. See, we all feel better right now. We all feel better about Islam. Uh that would be that would be what what would happen if someone like Shabir Ali was was on there. But instead you got Muhammad oh, and his followers, his followers are show him, show him Muhammad Hijab. Put that woman in her place, beat her in this mission, crush her, destroy her heart, humiliate her. And Hajab goes, I will humiliate you. I will humiliate all of you and show you. You never speak against Islam. And someone, someone like Michaela and her fans are going, Oh my goodness, <laughs> this is what they're doing to this victim of female genital mutilation who is under perpetual death threat for her entire life just for speaking against this ideology. And whose friend was brutally murdered in the streets for daring to criticize this ideology. And he acts like this towards her. This is horrifying. There is a part in this episode. There is a part in this episode. I believe as far as I understand it, she hosts these uh, discussions, these opposing views discussions, and they are not even live. It's not like the two sides are talking to each other. It's uh, the two sides are recorded at separate times. And then she 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 presents them uh, going against each other. And um, she wants to let them talk freely and say whatever they want as much as possible. But in this episode, there is a specific point where in the end she... I guess uh, can't hold it back anymore and say okay and, and says okay 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 stop you know and so <laughs> she she actually stops Muhammad Hijab because he's he gets very loud and very aggressive and he's not even talking to Ayan Hirsi personally but let's let's get to it you know let, let's get to it let's let's keep watching it and let's, let's see <laughs> I love what's this going guy on. man I love this guy okay. it, it's amazing I really think Muhammad Hijab I would completely support Muhammad Hijab appearing on Fox News or better yet on Ever C on CNN or on an extended interview or something yeah you, we, we we've we've seen them trying to get him on Logan Paul or Jake but one of the one of the he's trying to get on all these podcasts listen guys you can tell all these podcasters uh all these podcasters that Muhammad Sajjab's fans are trying to get him on uh D Wood says yes do it <laughs> do it do okay. it that's who we want okay let's go NordVPN no okay okay uh advertisement yeah, you'd have to get some kickback if you replay her advertisement. Yeah. Thanks <laughs> for having me. We've been trying to do this for a long time. I'm glad that we're podcast. How are you doing? Thank you very much for joining me on my podcast. <laughs> Michaela, thank you very much for having me. We've been trying to do this for a long time. I'm glad that we're finally doing it. I'm, I'm so glad. This is going to be very, very interesting. So I'm happy about it. I hope so. Yeah. Okay. Let's get started. So we're doing we're doing a podcast on Islam today, and I have a number of questions. So I'm just going to get right into it. If that, actually no, let's start off with if anyone who doesn't know who you are, can you give a brief background about who you are and what it is? Wait a minute. V very quick comment. Um, somebody, one of my mods, uh, timed out Sam Shimu, <laughs> which I can understand. Don't time out Sam Shimu, please. <laughs> As you do. So my name is Ayan Hirsi Ali. I was born in Somalia and I lived in uh, Saudi Arabia, in Ethiopia, in Kenya. And when I was 22 years old, I went to the Netherlands. And I think I'm famous or infamous for leaving Islam 
And uh, having lived in uh, these African and Middle Eastern countries after I arrived in the Netherlands, um, having made a journey that's not just geographical, not just physical, but intellectual. And so when I got acquainted with the norms and values of the West, such as freedom, equality, the rule of law, uh, women's rights, um, I thought that those values and those principles were superior to the ones that I was raised in. Uh, I was raised within the culture of Islam and in a tribal society. That's true. And so uh, I would say in a nutshell, that's my story. Okay, great. Okay, so I'm going to start off with, with um, what, what was your experience? And this is kind of a broad question, but what it, was your experience with Islam like? Well, in the early years, you know, before I was 20 years old, I would say um, it was mundane. We were not extremely religious. Uh, we identified ourselves as Muslims, prayed five times a day when we could and all that. But uh, we didn't really have the fundamentalist fanatical strains that we see later. When In the 1980s, when I was a teenager, there were teachers who came to our schools and our neighborhoods who were propagating this radical strain. And um, I joined them. I, I fell for it. What attracted me, I think, was just the, um, the clarity that they offered. You know, you've got a whole list of here are the things that are forbidden in Islam. Here are the things that are permitted. And all you have to do is just abide by these rules and you're a good person. Um, and then once I started actually uh, trying to abide by those rules, I found out how extremely difficult it was. And then later on in my life, when I came to the Netherlands and I saw people who are actually good people, honest people, people who tell the truth and who do things in ways that are very productive in their relationships with other human beings and within the world, that's when I started to reflect on Islam, both in the sense that I was raised where it, we were passive Muslims and later on when we became, I became an active fanatical believer. Interesting. So um, a very personal uh, experience with Islam, uh, grow, grows up in a not so religious environment, sees the very religious currents, uh, or the extreme ones, I guess, uh, finds their clarity in having everything strictly laid out interesting, tries to practice it, but uh, quickly finds out that it is not really that easy to practice because it's pretty, pretty uh, oppressive and authoritarian one could say, sees the West and sees the contrast between her own, uh, you know, culture and religion and, uh, and and what she finds in the, in the Netherlands. And that leads her through her journey out of Islam. Very personal response, right? And very concise so far. Yeah. And you, you, you know, notice if you had no clue who Ayan Hirsi Ali was, I, I read her book. What was her book? Infidel? The main one? The main one where... where yeah, I, th I, I think, it's, I think she it's had, Yeah, she had one before that, which wasn't as popular. Uh, I think the caged version. I started reading that, did not finish. I did read Infidel, though. But notice, if you're reading this, I mean, if you were, if you were seeing this for the first time, you think, uh, wow, a woman who grew up in a certain context and then was able to compare what she was raised with with something else and then decided, hey, I, I, I think that other thing is better. She's coming across as a very nice, thoughtful person, as opposed to maybe someone else. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if it was infidel or what, 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 what was it called heretic or something. I don't know. I don't know. It I, was I something. Wait, let me look it up real quick. Yeah, you, 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 go, <laughs> you, go, to, you go ahead. You go ahead. You go ahead and talk uh, amongst uh, yourself, AP. Book, book publications books i don't remember the names i uh okay yeah now you're right it's infidel okay she has the book infidel and a book named heretic that's fine that's right uh and she had some dutch books before that so and then she has a new book called prey that's true did did you did you ever see uh did you ever see that Theo van gogh short movie um you mean the the one yeah the one the one that they made together yes i, I did yeah, that was my the goodness. One the, was... the one with the woman who yeah. seemingly prays yeah, to Allah. Yeah, she's talking to Allah and she's got the verses written on her body and stuff yes, like that. Yes, that was, yes. uh, Pretty that intense. was brutal, man. That's what happens when you get a, a skilled filmmaker criticizing yeah. something. That was pretty... And they responded by chopping his head off. Yeah. Okay. Um, were the people you were seeing in the Netherlands, were these other religious people, were like Christianity or, or atheist, agnostic, or just in general? Uh, many of them were Christian. So when I first arrived at the Asylum Seekers Center, most of the people who volunteered to help asylum seekers, refugees, uh, they did it through their churches. So they were Christians. 
And the Christianity that I saw that was practiced in the Netherlands was a very appealing Christianity. People were actually, um, I, I thought, very generous, very tolerant. Uh, for instance, even though they volunteered to help us as non-Christians, they didn't demand that we convert to Christianity. They didn't preach their religion. They didn't impose on us in that way at all. Um, and, and I thought that was interesting because when uh, I started to become an active Muslim and abide by these rules of, you know, the permitted and the forbidden and all that, and I, I really wanted to be a good Muslim. One of the things that our teachers were telling us was, you have to go and convert non-Muslims. And, uh, and I thought it was interesting when I came to the Netherlands that these Christians uh, were not imposing or preaching or proselytizing their faith. Uh, they believed that they were just doing good uh, for the sake of goodness itself mm. and, and, and so but there were also agnostics there were atheists uh, later on as you know I, I left the asylum seeker center i went to college i found jobs and uh, i was surrounded uh, by the time i left 14 years later by the time i left the netherlands i was surrounded more by agnostics and atheists than christians okay interesting uh the, the here is a thing the thing that she just said uh like in her own circle she was in a religious muslim circle and uh they were always told to to preach and to convert everyone and this and that and uh it, where she arrived in, in the netherlands she was uh, helped by people who are who selflessly help just for goodness and don't even preach or anything uh just for saying stuff like this she would be labeled and called a uh, you know, a sellout or uh, whatever it is, whatever words these people generally use. But these are completely, uh, completely accurate observations of, you know, by somebody who experienced both cultures very, uh, very deeply. There is simply a huge contrast. In the West, you see this, uh, this selfless help that you receive, whereas uh, in, in, in Islamic culture, this culture doesn't really exist in such a sense. You don't have lots of people who simply go out there just to help you. You or you only have uh, you only have that mixed with extremely harsh uh, religious intolerant religious attitudes. Uh, yeah, and I mean, I would say there there is a there is a, a big emphasis on preaching the gospel and so on mm -hmm. and, and, and so on in, in Christianity, uh, but that is, I mean, that's combined with the view that all people are created in the image of God. Uh, we're commanded to love everyone, even our enemies. Uh, we're told to honor all people. And so it, it exists simultaneously that you want, you want to preach the gospel, but even if someone's not converting, you can still do good in the world that is still good, even if it has nothing to do with people converting. Whereas uh, in Islam, it's, hey, Allah has no love. Allah, ha Allah himself has no love for the unbelievers, right? Mm -hmm. That's straight out of the Quran. Allah does not love the unbelievers. And so what sort of love concern are you supposed to have for unbelievers, people who reject Muhammad? Well, they're the worst of creatures, according to the Quran. Surah 98 verse 6, they're the worst of creatures. And so, you know, you, you can have you can have individual Muslims or even Muslim organizations that will uh, be doing positive things in the, in the world. And you can have Christians who are the biggest jerks in the in the world. But uh, because of what the because of what these religions teach, the, statistically, you're going to have some some differences in the populations that they produce. So you will now see the manifestation of of, of the of Allah's love. Uh, because we are now coming to Muhammad Hijab's introduction. So. Muhammad Hijab, welcome to my podcast. Welcome. Hey, smile. That's good. <laughs> I don't understand why he says welcome. I'm still stuck on that. Is it, is that a language thing or, hey. or, or, or was it just a mistake? Or, or... You're welcome for me <laughs> being here. <laughs> I thought, wait a minute, is, is he hosting her also simultaneously on his own podcast and that's why he says welcome? Or is it just one of those awkward moments where you accidentally say welcome and then you're like, oh, oh what did I do? Uh, well, I, I have to say, I mean, he made, he, made a, he made a good first impression with that smile. I was expecting, uh, listen, with your inferior intellect, you two women combined, oh, you, <laughs> two you women will combined that. have the you brain of one man. That. You will see that very quickly. Just, just, just hold on. You will see that very quickly. Thank you very much for being here. This should be an interesting episode. Um, before we get started, can you give anyone who doesn't know who you are a brief background about who you are and what it is you do? All right. So my name is Mohammed Hijab. Um, much like yourself, I'm a 
Gold I'm a YouTuber. Uh, I'm the co-founder of the Sapiens Institute. My academic background is in politics and um, history, where I've acquired a postgraduate in that as well. Uh, Islamic studies, of course, which I've acquired, acquired a postgraduate in as well, in addition to um, applied theology. Um, and I'm currently doing my, my PhD in the philosophy of religion. I have to say, uh, Michaela, from the outset here, that unlike the co-guest, the ultra-crepidarian academic charlatan uh, co-guest that you have, the secret um, apple polish of the far right, <laughs> I am McGann, which is actually her real name. I'm actually qualified to speak about that, which we'll be speaking about today. <laughs> Did he see, He just said ultra crepidary. <laughs> he said the word. He learned. He learned. <laughs> oh, man. So. He did watch the Yasser Qadi video where Yasser Qadi taught everyone the meaning of the word ultra crepidarian. And he was right. That is a word you learn. You could learn it for your SAT, but definitely, um, uh, definitely, definitely for the test you take to get into graduate school, you would learn that. And uh, Muhammad Ajab was watching ultra crepidarian. <laughs> So, so that is, the, that is, I mean, apart from people who are using it to make fun of Yasser Qadi for using it, that is the second time in my life I've ever, I think I've ever heard someone actually use it. <laughs> I will play it again, but see the contrast. Uh, uh, Ayan Hussein Ali introduces herself as I am, I am uh, Ayan Hussein Ali, I'm this and this, and I've made a long journey and I've seen this. And then, hello, Mohammed Hijab, please introduce yourself. It's like, yeah, Ayan introduce Hussein yourself. So, so give us that same story. <laughs> yeah, so, so it's, it's, uh, it's notice, it's, I mean, Ayan Hersey Ali took a few minutes to actually introduce herself, build yeah. some rapport with viewers. <laughs> And uh, Mohammed Hijab, why don't you introduce yourself? <laughs> yeah, 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 Mohammed Hijab, Sapiens Institute. Listen, let me tell you about the golden showers that I'm going to rain down upon, blah, 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 blah. For anyone who doesn't know what we're talking about, uh, Mohammed Hijab sent, sent a pile of messages to us about uh, giving golden showers and stuff like that. Anyway, that's why we keep bringing it up. Uh, oh, so yeah. don't, think, don't think we're just bringing that up for, you know, for no reason. But yeah, anyway, we, we, don't, we, don't, we never came up with the idea of talking about golden showers. That was Ultra all... crepidary. That was all the ultra crepidarian Muhammad Hijab's work. Uh, and for all who want proof, here it is. Oh, there we go. Here it is. Hey, let, let's read them. <laughs> you can play with each other. <laughs> Get on your knees for David Wood. <laughs> Kimp, David Wood can give you a golden shower. <laughs> Go ahead and give David Wood what wants. Wink. <laughs> let David Wood give you a golden shower. Gimp, get on your knees for your master, boy. Get on your knees. <laughs> You can suck that golden shower from your master. I know you need a slave master. Golden shower. Gimp, get on your knees for it. Let him slap your face, you fiend. <laughs> this is this is the champion of Islam that everyone wants to that that Muslims want to put forward to to insult Ayan Hirsi Ali and put put her in her place the way he he puts us in our place. Wow. Yeah, fantastic work. So I'll I'll, I'll play this. Great game. work. I'm currently doing my my PhD in the philosophy of religion. I have to say, uh, Michaela, from the outset here, that unlike the co-guest, the ultra-crepidarian academic charlatan uh, co-guest that you have, <laughs> obsequious... Um, Did he just say obsequious? Oh, I, yeah. I am um, McGann, which is actually her real name. Oh. I'm actually qualified to speak about that, which we <laughs> speaking about today. <laughs> He's, he uses those same words again later on. It's, um... I, I'm trying to. Who's she obsequious towards? Like, like Western, Western. Yeah, I, I guess that's that's the point here. That she is a, uh, you know, a subservient uh, a woman who sucks up to the white man or stuff like that. He goes into that later on again. It's it's and, very and, and, messed up. And by the way, think about this. The the only way she was actually able to get out of Islam was for being the opposite of that, right? She's yeah. she's the op that's the opposite of her personality. Whereas what Muhammad Hijab wants women to be like is exactly what he's accusing her of being, right? Yeah. She's the opposite, but then he 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 condemns her for being what he wants women to be, but only towards Islam. It's very him. funny. It's very funny. What a religion, man. What a religion. What a religion. Okay. It's quite an intro. Let's get started. I'm going to be asking you the same questions. Okay. Um, so first, what's your experience with Islam been like? I know that's kind of vague, but go for it. Yeah, I mean, for me, obviously, Islam is 
everything in the sense that it defines how my purpose of life. My purpose of life is to worship one God, uh, submit my will to one God who is the creator of the universe. I um, wake up in the morning uh, thinking of that, go to sleep thinking of that. Um, it gives me anchorage, Michaela. It gives and me more showers. Uh, an existential <laughs> anchorage. It allows me to live my life in a way which is meaningful and purposeful. Uh, there's a tradition of the Prophet Muhammad where he said, wonder is the affair of the believer. That all of his affair is good. And that is not the case for anyone except for the believer. And that if something good happens to him, he is patient. And if something bad happens to him, he is patient and he is thankful and patient. Unlike the ultra crepidarian... Yeah. So in other words, for me, I think in terms of my own kind of personal life, what it does is it makes meaning out of pain because life is full of pain, Michaela, as we all know. It's <laughs> something that you, I think having a framework, a religious framework, where the, the center is or the central aspect of it is to worship one God, that there's an eschatological dimension, um, that we believe in one God, the of worship, not a man, not you know the creation, but one God. We believe in Jesus. We believe in the Old, you know, the Old Testament prophets and so on. It does give me... And that stability that I think is uh, priceless. Um, and I have to say that um, I, I can't imagine really a life without it. You know, uh, so in, in, in a nutshell, really, what Islam is for me is, is something which not only gives me meaning and purpose, but that if it was, if it was not part of my life, I couldn't imagine uh, what kind of depressed, a perpetually depressed I would be in. <laughs> yeah, and, and that, that actually explains a lot. And I'm sure, I'm sure you're thinking the same thing I was thinking, AP. Uh, according to Muhammad Hijab, in messages that he has actually posted towards you, since you do not have that glorious life of chest, me oh, strong, me strong, that he has, uh, what should you actually do, according to him? Commit suicide. We're not, we're not making that up, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, hijab has told AP, uh, yeah, you need to, uh, you should, uh, you should yeah. consider suicide. If I were an anxiety ridden, hate filled nihilist atheist like Apus, I would consider suicide as a serious option. That is because the world offers such humans, uh, in quotation marks, more pain than pleasure. <laughs> you're not, you're not real. <laughs> humans like AP, <laughs> the pain of being a coward, the pain of having no purpose, just find a tall building and find a tall building. Apus, I want to give you sincere advice. I think you should commit suicide, Dang. not because you are a talentless coward or because you are a waste <laughs> of space. I think the world is offering you more pain than pleasure. It is not morally objectionable for you, so why not? There you go. <laughs> Airtight argument from Muhammad Hijab. Yeah. The, so, the, cha the champion of Islam that Muslims around the world want to represent them on their... If you don't agree with me, you should all commit suicide. You should... And by the way, this I mean, you find that in the Quran. And then you've got Muhammad repeatedly, oh, Gabriel's not doing what I want, or I'm so scared. And he repeatedly tries to kill himself by hurling himself off a cliff. Yeah. Um, you see why the why hijab has this obsession. So uh, more more, more uh, great teachings from the religion yeah. of, of Islam. Fantastic, man. So everyone who is depressed and who doesn't uh, have a moral uh, grounding um, kill yourself. has a message for you. Kill yourself, boy! <laughs> Okay, um, so this is actually, this isn't the question I asked Ayan, because uh, I don't think it was as relevant, but is there a reason that um, you, I wouldn't say chose necessarily, but you're practicing, you're practicing Muslim as opposed to a Christian or another religion that worships one God? Well, look, first and foremost, we would object, object to the fact that Christianity worships one God. Christi Christianity, both Catholicism and Protestantism. Did you say Catholicism? The, of the Trinity. Catholicism. <laughs> I think you said that, I don't know. It's yeah. They believe in the Father, the Son, and Protestantism. That Christianity worships one God. Christi Christianity, both Catholicism and Protestantism, <laughs> believe in the doctrine of the Trinity. They believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That the Father is God, the Son is God, and the, the Holy Spirit is God. But that That's there are true. not three gods, but one God. And we say that that is an unintelligible position. That's something that flies right in the face of reason, which is not possible logically. And that it's inconceivable, it's unintelligible, and it's unpardonable to believe that any man with a date of birth can be called God. And so Jesus Christ for us as Muslims is the Messiah. He is a prophet sent with wonders and miracles and signs as the Bible correctly says in this point, but we cannot. Okay, I, I, wanna, I wanna say uh, something. I, you know, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in God. I don't believe in the Trinity. I don't believe in the Bible and so on. Uh, the, 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 there are a few things that need to be said. You could not possibly 
uh, you know, understand logic and then uh, put forth the idea that the Trinity is contrary to logic, that it is logically impossible. There is nothing logically impossible about it. There is you, you cannot you cannot make an argument, uh, you know, with his standing uh, where he himself believes in the supernatural, and uh, and and say that 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 is uh, you know logically impossible that it doesn't work. It is that that simply it doesn't go. You know, <clears throat> and another thing is uh, there was something else I wanted to address quickly. Was that, um, oh, yeah, the, the other thing is of course. Um, what's funny is he wants to dismiss Christianity here uh, as something that he would, of course, never choose. But uh, he did not uh, have a choice between Christianity and Islam. So why he comments on that is beyond me. People are saying that I'm having a lag. Do yeah, you I saw that. Pe some people are saying it's all right now. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. He yeah, didn't okay. choose Islam. <clears throat> I just want to say that. So the question is kind of answered in a terrible way. He didn't choose Islam. He was simply a born as a Muslim. Uh, guys, what a uh, what do you mean the lag? That there's a there's a lag between his voice. Uh oh. Hmm. Oh boy. YouTube Bad is not receiving enough. Some people are saying it's fine now. Oh. Uh, some people are saying it's good now. Other people are saying it's not good. It's well, cranking well, it well. Out. I have a fantastic, bombastic internet connection, so I don't know, I don't know what the problem here is. Is it's, it? I, I see it in, in my in my screen. It says YouTube is not receiving enough video to maintain smooth streaming. That's what it's. I don't know why, though. Oh, people are saying it's fine now. Oh. Everyone's saying good now. It must have been a lag, but it's over now. Okay, yeah, must have been a lag. But it's so funny. Oh, yeah. Yeah, AP, uh, uh, by the way, I I, I, I agree with you. It, it's not simply, well, I happen to disagree with Muhammad Hijab that uh, when he says that the Trinity is logically impossible. It, it's, it's like you said. If you say that it, there's a logical contradiction in the definition of the Trinity, you don't understand what – you either don't understand what logic is or you don't understand the doctrine of the Trinity. Mm -hmm. Um because not a logical contradiction. There are things like this all around us all the time, right? I mean, the Quran is one in that it's a book. Uh, it's 114 in chapter. It's one in one way, more than one in another way. Allah is one in one way, more than one in another way. So he's one in uh, in nature, being, or essence. He's 99 in, 99 in name, even though he has more names than that. Uh, if you wanted to list Allah's attributes, notice he's He's one in nature of being, but he's more than one in attributes, right? And, and notice the attributes can actually be in conflict. One attribute can say one thing. So his his uh, his mercy triumphs over his wrath. He's got two attributes in conflict, demanding different things. You don't say, well, therefore you're you're dealing with two different gods, right? <clears throat> you say that it's the... Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so uh so so it's not a contradiction to say that something is one in one way more than one another. You can say it's ridiculous. You could say it's not true. You could say it's false. You could say it's refuted by something. And here's an argument against it. But when you, it's a logical contradiction, you don't know what, you don't know what the heck you're talking about. Right. Cool. And likewise, when he says, uh, you can't believe anything is God if it has a, if it has a birthday. Uh, can I say something very quickly about mm -hmm. that? Just very briefly. I mean, you have, 2000 years of Christology, right? Mm -hmm. 2000 years of Christology, which went through so many different discussions and debates and uh, formations and whatever it is. 2000 years of Christology, very intense first centuries of Christology, discussing the nature of Jesus and the nature of God. And then you have somebody in 2000, in, here in 2022, who's like, oh, of course it's wrong because, you know, how can somebody with a birth date be, be God? I mean, are you kidding me, man? Yeah, and it's, it's noticed. The, the level of, I mean, it's just stupid, right? If you want to say it's false and give a reason why it's false, great. But when they act like there's this contradiction inherent, well, you can't be God if you, you know, have a birthday. Well, yeah, if you're God in his eternal nature, it doesn't make sense to have a birthday. If you're God who becomes incarnate, who takes on a human nature, then you're in a different situation. And notice the parallel. Notice we can, we can totally throw out the Quran, based on what he says, right? So, yeah. what is the what is the Quran according to Islam? It's the eternal speech of Allah. But I have multiple copies of the Quran. Notice I, those have publication dates on them. So, notice I can say, according to Muhammad Ajab, I can't believe that anything 
is the speech of Allah. It's the word of Allah. If it has a publication date on it and the book was made on a certain day, I cannot believe that. Well, great. That's the Qurans I have. So the Qurans are not the word of God. The Quran's not the not the word of God, right? The Quran, yeah. the Quran is not the word of God because the Quran has a has a publication date on it, right? Yeah. Now, notice the the correct answer to that little uh, little uh, problem there, according to Islamic theology, is that the Quran has two natures. The Quran is the eternal speech of Allah, but when it uh, enters creation in a form we can we can uh, we can have access to, it's either written on the hearts of believers. Or in which case there's a day when that happens, there's a day when you're at when it's actually revealed to you and you actually learn it and it's written on your heart, or it's in a physical book form made of paper and glue and ink. Notice, according to what he just said, he just he just destroyed the Quran. I cannot believe that the Quran is the word of God because because of that. Because yeah. it's supposedly eternal and yet it has a publication date on it. It's it's completely yeah. ridiculous. Brother makes a good point. Yeah. Brother makes a good point. By the way, uh AP, uh we haven't made it too far through this. Let's if, go further. You might you might need to do like multiple parts, like where we go through like half an or, hour, or you just or you just uh, don't talk uh, much. Yeah, but you're, you're going to talk, and that's the problem. <laughs> so if we just if neither one of us talks, it would only take another uh, another uh, hour and twenty eight minutes. Just a very quick note, Tatiana said, or, uh, AP or David, have you seen the video where Hijab claims that Jordan Peterson is likely to convert to Islam after that conversation? If so, thoughts? I have seen it and I wanted to react to it very briefly. I still haven't done it, but I might do it in a few days. Yeah, I, I have not seen that, but uh, you, you know what? He, he, he basically what? says, well, Islam very much agrees with uh, you know Jordan Peterson's ideas, and I believe it is very likely that after this, uh, Jordan Peterson will convert to Islam very soon. Like, <laughs> One thing I I, I can't figure out, right? Because I can normally, uh, uh, I can normally read someone like a job, like a book. But there, there are certain things like, like when he's saying, "Oh, because uh, because I said this or that in the video or something like that." I know there, I heard that he was reciting the Quran to him or something like this. Uh, he's going to convert. I, what I can't figure out about hijab is whether he believes it when he says things like that, or if that's just to impress his followers, right? Like. Yeah, that's that's that puzzles me too. It's yeah. it's a weird thing to publicly say. I, I'm I'm like I'm like I'm like fifty fifty on that. Whether when he's going on the in other words, when he's going on these podcasts, is he really thinking, "Hey, I'm going to go on this podcast and I'm going to I'm going to smash Ayan Hirsi Ali, and this will show them that Islam is true and people will convert"? Does he actually think that, or is it, "Hey, I know this is just going to." Turn, I mean, people are going to be absolutely repulsed by yeah. what I'm saying. But yeah. my followers who are lifting me up on this pedestal, I'll be their hero. So I, yeah. I, I will become the hero of more and more Muslims. They'll support me more in my in my dawah. I'll be their champion and so on. Uh, so which one is it? Does he actually believe, oh, yes, they're all going to convert. Mm -hmm. all, my arguments are so powerful and so great. Or is it just, yes, they all obviously are going to think this is ridiculous. Yeah. But yeah. my fans... Yeah. Yeah. They imp they're impressed. Okay, I will have to mute you, David. Please, uh, it's important stuff, man. You got to give people <laughs> what they want. This is straight dope. Yeah, let's continue. <laughs> not believe, and we do not believe that Jesus Christ is God or the Son of God. We believe that Jesus Christ was a mighty messenger sent from God Almighty, and that he was a person who was one of the greatest people who ever lived on this earth. We believe, and from that perspective, we're Christians because we follow Christ. But we don't believe that Jesus Christ is God. And in addition, I would say. We believe the final prophet Muhammad, he had evidences that indicates the truth and the veracity of his prophethood. And for yes. that reason, I, I, to be honest with you, I do believe it's a choice that everyone does have to make. And this is the reason why I am a Muslim. Because, But if you make the wrong choice, then... <laughs> uh, the proof is in Isaiah 42. <laughs> <laughs> it's just instinctively, it speaks to me that you have to worship one God, whether, you know, the, the creator of the heavens and the earth, and that no creation can be God. And this is the, the the dividing line or the fundamental difference between Muslims and Christians. I'm sorry, I have to say something, but no matter who you are, no matter where you stand, if you make, if you give this speech and say what he just said at the very end, I'm, I, I'm sorry, but I can't take that seriously. You can't say, uh, if, if you're born into a religion and it's very obvious that you are in that religion and you grew up with that, you you, you can't say that uh, obviously everybody has a choice and I have obviously made my choice and it speaks to me and this and that. I, I'm sorry, that's just not true. 
Yeah. It's yeah. simply not true. You could find a different explanation for that, and that's okay. But saying this, it just makes me not take you seriously. Yeah. And uh, that, that <laughs> notice the sort of insanity here. Like, uh, we don't believe Jesus is the Son of God. We believe he's this prophet of Islam. That makes much more sense. But, I mean, think about it. Um, the sources that are confirmed as the inspired, preserved, authoritative word of Allah, according to the Quran, he affirms the gospel that was in the possession of the Christians in the seventh century. We know what yeah. the gospel was. It was called the fourfold gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the father identifies Jesus as the son. The Holy Spirit identifies Jesus as the son. Jesus repeatedly identifies himself as the son. The angel Gabriel identifies Jesus as the son. The prophet John the Baptist identifies mm -hmm. Jesus as the son. Jesus followers identify him as the son. Uh, even demons, while they're screaming in agony and being in his presence, call him the son. Uh, the Roman uh, Roman soldier identifies him as the son. Men identify him as the son. Women identify him as the son. Even the Jews who rejected him, one of their accusations against, one of their condemnations against him was that he was claiming to be the son. So everyone who could actually confirm whether Jesus was claiming to be the son, everyone who could identify him as the son did and then, David, and then, David. What? And then six, wait, wait, David. six centuries later, an illiterate caravan robber comes along and says, huh, how can he have a son? How can Allah have a son? He got no wife. Doesn't understand anything anyone's saying. And then John goes, oh, great point. Great point. I don't understand it either. Ha -ha, brilliant point. David, What's David you're reading the Gospels through a Christian lens. The Gospels actually confirm the Islamic message. If you read the Gospels themselves, you will find that they agree with Islam. And... Yeah, you, yes, you shouldn't yes. read the, through the when, Christian lens. When the father says, this is my <laughs> beloved son in whom I will please, he means this is merely a prophet. <laughs> Don't believe the Christian. <laughs> and, and you know, the best, the, the, there is this amazing, amazing proof, which uh, Islam, which the Quran provides us with when it comes to the argument of why Jesus is not God and why his mother is also not God. For some reason, it also needs to provide that evidence. But it's, it makes, it, it gives us very clear proof. The Quran says, Says, Jesus and Mary both used to eat food, so therefore they are not God. That's it. Done. The end of story. That is evidence. That is proof. That's what the Quran says. We are done, man. Yeah. So, it's, so it's, yeah. I mean, yeah. It's just why are we still talking? Well, we'll yeah. we'll completely ignore the whole thing about the incarnation and taking on yeah. a human nature and yeah. uh, why, pretend why you didn't say that. Talking? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For, yeah, yeah. For, forget about that. It's just the Quran makes it all clear. <laughs> Okay, thank you. In in your experience, <clears throat> has, is is Islam innately misogynistic? The answer to that, unfortunately, is a clear cut yes. Okay, Islam is misogynistic in its approach to women. I know that by saying this, I uh, offend a lot of people. I know that people's feelings get hurt. The feelings of Muslims. I know that that is the case. But setting feelings aside and just looking objectively at what it is um, that Islam says about women, and where it positions us, the answer is yes, it is misogynistic. And I'll give you a few examples. That would be good, yeah. And I think the best example, because it's so factual, is the law, Sharia law, Islamic law. Islamic law declares that a woman has to have a male guardian at all times. That's not required of males. In Sharia law, a man is permitted to have four wives. She's not permitted to have four husbands. In Islamic law, in Sharia law, a woman's testimony in court is worth half of that of a man. It's not the other way around. Um, a sister inherits half of what her brother inherits. Wow. And this goes on and on. And I think to be, because these basic tenets of law, Sharia law, when they're implemented and where they're implemented, you see a huge difference between the way men and women are treated, girls and boys are treated. And I would say that is misogyny. Plus, a woman shall stay at home as long as she doesn't absolutely have to go out, uh, has to ask for the man's permission, uh, can't travel by herself. Uh, a woman can be beaten if she is too arrogant. A woman must be obedient. The Quran explicitly says twice that the, that the man is superior to the woman and so on. So there is so much to that. And because I'm not, I'm not that familiar with um, Islam, is Sharia law something that's in the Quran directly? 
Sharia law is derived from the Quran and from the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad. The Prophet Muhammad is the founder of Islam, and his legacy is a body of law. You see, law. she said, Prophet Muhammad. <laughs> this like is so the proof. Any of the other societies that try to establish um, legal systems that are based on Islam. Um, okay. So another example on the misogyny side is women are expected to cover their bodies. And there is some kind of discussion on how much of that. In some cases, they let you show the face and the hands. And in extreme cases, you have to be covered from head to toe, um, confined yeah. to the house. Yeah. Uh, your male guardian uh, chooses, or at yeah. least you need his endorsement to marry someone else. Yeah. Because of course, there are, this needs to be defined, because if it's defined <laughs> definitionally, more... Like, like, like ultra uh, Let's define that. Well, first and foremost, of course, there are, misogyny needs to be defined because if it's defined definitionally as it is in the kind of dictionary, the hatred of women, then the answer is very clearly no. Because the Quran very clearly states in more than one verse, you know, in chapter three, verse 109. <laughs> okay, very clear, very, very quick note. Okay, very, very quick note. Muhammad Hijab is the same person who, who uses the word Islamophobes when he describes people like David and us. If you go to the dictionary definition, Islamoph Islamophobia would be, uh, if you, you know, deconstruct the word, the fear of Islam. Are we afraid of Islam? I'm certainly not. You are not either. So that means we are definitely not Islamophobes. Case closed. Why doesn't he apply the same logic there? Of course, he will not because he applies such logic only when it's convenient. Misogynistic here refers in these terms to something that degrades women, which is why it is, uh, you know, uh, related to hating women. So if he wants to bring it down to the definition and say no islam doesn't hate women that doesn't mean anything i'm sorry <laughs> yes god does not let to waste any action of any doer among you men or women and that both of you are from one another that uh, in chapter 33 verse 35 uh, the, the believing men and the believing women and the you know and so on and it mentions a, a list of attributes mentioning men and women specifically and then says that god has prepared for them a reward and in fact the quran explicitly mentions that we cannot have hatred towards any believer because it's mentioned in chapter 59 of the Quran, God do not put any hatred to the believers in our hearts. And that, of course, includes women as well. So from that perspective, it's impossible to postulate. It is impossible to postulate that Islam is... <laughs> what we will say is... Possible to postulate. This is so dumb. He does not respond to the question it's at all. Possible to postulate. Yeah, but talks about something entirely irrelevant, which does not address the point. Yeah. <laughs> do you want to go on? Or, yeah. <laughs> No, I'm just saying you're you're ignoring the fact that it is impossible to postulate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's, it's... <laughs> misogyny is a label that is used haphazardly and arbitrarily between people in the West in discourses to mean different things. So, of course, neoconservatives or people that are more right wing or alt right are accused, accuse themselves of being misogynistic to uh, by um, third wave feminists and so on. And so, it really depends on who is the one making the claim and what the robust definition that they have of misogyny is. And sometimes that can be ideologically. Um, uh, kind of inspired in the case of third wave feminists, I would say it certainly is. That's why, unfortunately, uh, even your father has been uh, accused of misogyny. I mean, people in, in, in the West, uh, credible intellectuals and academics have been accused of misogyny just because they believe in a traditional uh, a value, uh, a traditional values of a family system, a complementarian family system. And uh, for this reason, they're accused of misogyny. So, but one has to say of what he's basically saying is Islam is, of course, not misogynistic because first you have to define what, what misogyny is. So in, in short, he also says, by that logic, he would also say Islam is not bad because it depends on what you mean by bad, or Islam is not violent because it depends on what you mean by violent. Islam is not hateful because it depends what you mean by hateful. So you can just get out of anything with that, you know. Yeah, very, let, let simple, me, very simple. Let, let me just let me just read a, a pastor. I mean, we'll take some advice for him. Uh, so misogynistic. Uh, I'm looking at a dictionary right now. Uh, strongly prejudiced against women. Um, a more expanded definition, hatred of, and he he could say, well, you know, we don't hate them or something like that, but hatred of, contempt for, or prejudice against women. Um, but I mean, I mean, we, we could read a ton of passages. Let me just read one. So Sahih Muslim 142. Oh, women folk, you should give charity and ask much forgiveness, for I saw you in bulk amongst the dwellers of hell. A wise lady among them said, why is it, Messenger of Allah, that our folk are in bulk in hell? Upon this, the Holy Prophet observed, you curse too much and are ungrateful to your spouses. I have seen none lacking in common sense and failing in religion, but at the same time, robbing the wisdom of the wise besides you. 
Upon this, the woman remarked, what is wrong with our common sense and with our religion? He, the holy prophet, observed, you lack common sense. Your lack of common sense can be well judged from the fact that the evidence of two women is equal to one man. That is a proof of the lack of common sense. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a ruling in Islam. The testimony of a woman is worth half that of a man. And a woman says, hey, Muhammad, uh, why do you say, I mean, how can you prove that we lack common sense? He says, well, I'll prove it to you. Your testimony is worth half that of a man, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> like He sounds like an idiot, that reasoning. And he's accusing them of, of lacking common sense. So women are, uh, they lack common sense. They're, they lack morality. They lead men astray. And because of that, most of the inhabitants of hell are women. And yeah. we could go into a, a ton of these passages, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. I, I have proof that you are inferior because in the book that has been revealed through my mouth to you, it says that your testimony is hot, worth half as much as the testimony of a man. This is proof that you are worth less than a man. So, yeah, well, what are you going to do? How are you going to argue against that? <laughs> yeah, hey, hey, listen, look at this. This is, uh, this is, this is short. Uh, Sahil Bukhari, 2658. The prophet said, isn't the witness of a woman equal to that half? Isn't the witness of a woman equal to half of that of a man? The women said, yes. He said, that is because of the deficiency of her mind. So listen, <laughs> if they ask, hey, why are our intellects deficient? He said, because your testimony is half that of a man. And when they say, hey, why is our testimony half as valuable as a man? He said, because of the deficiency of your intellect, right? <laughs> it's, it's like how, That's called circular, ladies and gentlemen. What, what do you say? He's like a, a thing attached to himself. What is that? How is it go? I don't know. Whatever whatever it is. But yeah, that, that's basically it. That's basically it. Circular reason. Yes, I think it's very important, Michaela, that we believe that there is an equality of value between men and women. We do believe that there's an equality of value between men and women. The Prophet himself, Muhammad, he said, that certainly men are equal to women. Please tell me if anybody knows the source of that hadith. Yeah, I, want to see I, have, that one. I have never heard of such a hadith. If anyone knows the source of this, please let me know. But in Islam, there is no, uh, it has absolutely no meaning to say that there is an equality in value or worth between men and women. That's not the question. It doesn't matter at all. What matters here is the question at hand. So don't strum in the position. What matters here is whether men and women are treated equally or fairly or not within a society. Nobody cares about their value to God, apparently. In front of the law, that is the general rule. That is a statement of the Prophet Muhammad. However, we do believe in exceptions. Men and women are equal in front of the law. Uh -huh. and we don't yeah, believe sure. that equality of value means identicality in roles. And so, of course, people that are detractors from the other side, like the academic charlatan Ayan McGann, who actually means refugee in the Somali language, of course, an ironic reminder to herself, she would say that Islam is misogynistic because of practices such as polygyny, of, which means that a man can marry more than one wife. And that is a practice that Muslims believe in. Or practices such as that Muslim men can marry Christian and Jewish women. And of course, that is something that Muslim women cannot do in Islam as well. And various other inheritance things or uh, aspects where there is a differential there between how men are treated to women. But we will say that equality of value does not mean identicality in roles. Let me say that one more time. Equality of value, we believe, does not mean identicality in roles. And therefore, just like Aristotle said, that like things should be treated like likewise and that different things should be treated the same. We do believe that women have a collective female temperament on certain aspects which need to be tailored for in legislation, which need to be tailored for in social and political life. And so therefore, if someone wants to use second wave feministic collectivistic discourses to try and attack the Islamic narrative, then they must first establish the truthfulness and the objective, the objectiveness of second wave feministic Don't make discourses. Me mad. <laughs> I am Mercy the feminist. We are opposed to feminism and we say that feminism has now almost certainly being cracked open as a false ideology of course how do you how do you <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, the, the, notice this entire this entire this entire thing look at this thing. i mean listen to how enraged he is at the idea of a woman disagreeing with it the entire <laughs> i mean it's like that's like hitler <laughs> 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 
<laughs> Dear Muhammad Tajab, can you please tell us about your religion? I am Hussein Ali, the charlatan. The... <laughs> we will destroy you. We will destroy you. How can you say we're misogynistic? You stupid woman. You stupid with your little pea brain. Whore. You're never a woman. There's so many women are in hell. You're so stupid. They're all stupid like you. Stupid like you. You don't know how to define a word. Whore. I mean, I mean, I mean, dude, this is this is why we love this guy, right? How He's coming on a podcast as a false ideology. I, I still don't understand. I mean, you, you could say it's not, it's not, it's not good. You could say it's not, it's not uh, productive, efficient, not beneficial, whatever. But how do you expose it as a false ideology? Does it make sense? Am I not getting this? I don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know either. But man, I mean, I mean, he he had a he had a golden opportunity. No pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> he had a golden opportunity here to present Islam to tons and tons of, of viewers who would have no, who might know absolutely nothing about it. This might be their only experience of what Islam teaches. And I uh, you women, I'll cross you all. Wow. I mean, and, and he's speaking here to a woman who is uh, free. Listen here, you stupid woman, woman. I'll tell you. Yeah. It's it's like it's 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 so weird. I, I don't even understand why he speaks to to Michaela here on this street on this and, video. He shouldn't be doing that. And 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 by the, by the way, I mean, notice he 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 could just be saying it. In a, he could say the same thing in a different way. Well, listen, uh, Michaela, I understand. Uh, you know, Ian has a different perspective on this, but let me just tell you, uh, I think you're wrong for this and this and this and that reason. What do you mean perspective? <laughs> We have to define perspective. <laughs> Let me define it. I'm so crap there in. You don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> I love this guy, man. This is... <laughs> I, think, I think I should add to this. In addition to all that, was <laughs> 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 oh, oh boy. So it's not just me, right? That frame was just no. That's not you. <laughs> what's funny is, as soon as we calm down, you push play again. I know he's going to do it again. <laughs> all right, all right. Let me be serious. Okay. The Iron McGann herself <laughs> is involved in the most embarrassing of public inquiries, if you can call that that. Whereby she herself was in a polygynous relationship. She was a mistress. She was a mistress. <laughs> Mary Ferguson, her. The husband now, and she was doing so at the dismay of Sue Douglas, who is his ex-wife, and with the destabilizing effect, of course, the destabilizing effect to his family, to Lachlan Ferguson, to Phoenix Ferguson, the children of Niall Ferguson. So she attacks polygyny in her books, but she practices it in her daily life. And so this is a serious hypocrisy, not just in that which she does, McGann, Ian McGann, but in that which she states as well. So I, I want to say one thing. Uh, I want to say one if thing. You too. are expected to introduce your ideas, which you think the public should accept. The, 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 the worst thing, I guess one of the worst things that you could do is to introduce them by attacking somebody else personally and digging into their personal life and attacking people mentioning their mentioning those people by name the worst way to represent your ideology and to and your beliefs which you want to give people is to attack the person on the other side personally and to go after them mm -hmm. who the hell comes out of this who, which non-muslim comes out of this and thinks oh yeah he makes very, a lot mm -hmm. of sense oh this is very yeah. good and, and notice we, we've talked about this a lot before the goal of the, the Muslim Dawah boys, their goal is not to answer arguments or to refute arguments. Their goal is to discredit the person who's bringing an argument or a criticism. And so it, there's a fallacy. This is considered a fallacy. This guy's, this guy's uh, lecturing us about logic. Mm -hmm. That's a fallacy, the yeah. irrelevant ad hominem. If I say two plus two is four, and you say no, but I look at you, look at your stupid face, blah blah blah. <laughs> oh, you murdered, uh, you murdered, uh, you murdered a bunch of people. It's, it's got nothing to do with whether two plus two is four. Nothing, nothing, yeah. right? So, so, so answer the argument. If you have a topic, is Islam misogynistic? But well, let me tell you, let me tell you about uh, Ayn Hirsi Ali's great great grandfather. What what are you talking about, dude? Like, what are you talking about? But notice, notice, it's so ingrained into Islam. Because that's the way it's been for 14 centuries. That I, he, I guarantee his fans are going, yes, Alhamdulillah, destroy her, yes, refute her, refute her by attacking her, 
her past and so on in, in your response to the question whether Islam is misogynistic. So yes, Muhammad, we want more fallacies, more fallacious reasoning. That's what we want in Islam. That's what we love. That's why we love you. That's why you're our champion. This, this, <laughs> you could go to any logic book on my shelf right here, and this will be in there as horribly fallacious reasoning. And that's what we want in Islam. Do it for us, brother. Wow, you gotta love this. Um, I'm gonna quickly make a poll here in the in the, in the chat. <clears throat> in your opinion, do most Muslims like the way Muhammad hijab? represented islam yes and no well if they don't will, they'll be, if they don't they'll be crushed i will i want to just ask this question as a poll here in the in the live chat right now and you can leave your vote but this is really something uh i really wonder what people think so far as uh as much as they have seen here what do you guys think do you think most muslims who have seen this uh are proud of this or not please let us know the, the challenge really is, and I will repeat this, if someone wants to quote aspects of the Islamic discourse, aspects of the Islamic uh, jurisprudential tradition, and juxtapose it with the Western discourses, especially here we're talking about second wave feminism, and expect Islam to correspond with those, they'll be utterly and bitterly disappointed, because clearly we believe our system is superior. We believe the system is failing. We believe that uh, nuclear households are de being destroyed in the West. We believe that you've got it wrong. We believe that we've got it right. And so in order to defeat us in argument, you must first argue from first principles. And so, yes, we do have differences with Western, especially second wave or third wave feministic discourses, but that does not, that does in no way sh uh, show or indicate that Islam is misogynistic. To the contrary, and the one last thing I will say is McGann herself oh. is blissfully ignorant. Ian McGann, Ian Hersey McGann, blissfully ignorant of the Islamic tradition, the underqualified, overconfident, ultra crepidarian academic <laughs> charlatan right-wing apple polisher, obsequious woman that she is, doesn't even know that. Doesn't even know that. <laughs> she laughed with us. She did, laughed with us. Did you see this reaction? <coughs> what does this reaction tell you? <coughs> what does that look like? I mean... Obsequious woman that she is, doesn't even know... <laughs> you know what she's laughing at? She's laughing at him using obsequious. Yes, yes. Let, let, let me try to sound smart. Let me try to sound intelligent. I mean, you have you have this woman here who is the host that you are here talking to, trying to impress, I guess, and you're using such words and repeatedly be repeatedly attacking uh, your opponent, who has nothing to do with the questions that the, that the host is asking. And as a result, the host reacts with a very uncomfortable, stressful laughter. And and notice how stupid his entire response there is. Right? It's hey, hijab. All these claims about beating women into submission and women being stupid and uh, women being less moral and women being, you know, the majority and hell and uh, all these things that your religion teaches. Uh, it's kind of the definition of misogynistic. So how do you respond? Well, if you're going to go to second wave feminism, no, no, we don't need to ever go. We don't need to go to second wave feminism. You could have people who think that second wave feminism is completely idiotic, who would also say, hey, it's misogynistic to just beat your wife into submission. Right. So he's, not, he's, he's just not answering. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. In her book, Heretic, in page 77, that we worship Muhammad, she doesn't even know the basics of the religion. She makes squandering mistakes one after the other about gender in jurisprudence in Islam. In her okay, uh, apparently, Ayanna Ali says, says in her book, Heretic, on page 77, that Muslims worship Muhammad. Uh, and obviously, Ayanna Hirsi Ali does not believe that most that Islam preaches worshiping Muhammad. Obviously, if she mm -hmm. says that, what she's saying is not that this is what Muslims intend to do, but that this is what they basically do mm -hmm. because they revere muhammad so much that they mm -hmm. worship him but mm -hmm. what does muhammad hijab do he says she says that we that muslims worship muhammad this just shows that she's ignorant about the basics of our religion okay this is here is the thing there are two <laughs> options now either muhammad hijab is so dense and stupid that he doesn't understand why ayan hirsi ali would say that muslims basically worship muhammad because mm -hmm. she's not saying that they literally do, but that they, you know, mm -hmm. almost basically do. Or which, which, which that's exactly that's exactly what I would say. Yes, you're not told worship Muhammad, yeah, but yeah. look at your behavior. You are yeah, doing yeah. what your religion identifies as worship, and you're directing yeah. it towards yeah. your prophet. 
Or there's a second option. Muhammad Hijab is uh, deliberately deceptive. He knows that Ayan Hirsi Ali says that Muslims basically worship Muhammad, but nevertheless, he takes this out of context in order to deliberately lie to the public and to accuse Ayan Hirsi Ali due to her rhetoric as uh, of being uh, ignorant about the basics of the religion. Two options. He's either stupid or a liar. What do you take? Uh, uh, or both. Don't. Or both. Yeah, or both. It yeah. doesn't have to be one or the other. <laughs> um, <clears throat> hey, yeah. Let, let, let me uh, let me actually give you an let me give you a quick argument here. Um, so, as far as worshiping, um, it, you have sir, you have Surah two. I mean, you have Surah nine, verse twenty nine of the Quran. Fight those who do not believe in Allah. And then the obvious question that would arise is, uh, why are we fighting Jews and Christians? when they're people of the book. And then so the next verse says, uh, the Jews call Ezra the son of God and Christians call Christ the son of God. That is a saying from their mouth, blah, 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 blah. But then the next verse gives further evidence that we're not really monotheists. It says, they take their priests and their rabbis to be lords in derogation of Allah. So one of the condemnations that shows we're not true monotheists is that we take, we take our priests and our rabbis <clears throat> as uh, as lords instead of Allah. Now, now listen to listen to this uh, little response. I mean, listen to this little commentary in Ibn Kathir. So the messenger of Allah recited this ayah. They took their rabbi. So anyone can look this. Anyone can go to Ibn Kathir. Go to the commentary on this verse of the Quran, Surah Nine, verse thirty-one. The Messenger of Allah recited this ayah. They took their rabbis and their monks to be lords besides Allah, right? So if you tell Christians, hey, you you know, you say Jesus is Lord, that's true. If you say you take your priests as lords, what are you talking about? What do you in what sense are we taking priests and pastors and rabbis as lords? Something that we are we're worshiping. So they took their rabbis and their monks to be lords and uh, besides Allah. Adi commented, so one of Muhammad's companions said. They did not worship them. So one of Muhammad's companions said they didn't worship them. The prophet said, yes, they did. They, the rabbis and monks, prohibited and allowed for them, Jews and Christians, and allowed that they, wait, this is confusing language. He says he pro, they prohibited the allowed and allowed the prohibited, and they obeyed them. This is how they worshiped them. So notice what Muhammad says. He says, wait a minute. Your priest tells you something is allowed that's actually not allowed by God. If you accept it from the priest, you're actually worshiping him. And if God says something is allowed and your priest says, no, that's not allowed, then you're worshiping your priest if you obey him. Now, why am I pointing this out? Because Muslims all the time are taking what Muhammad says as if it's a, a direct command from God. And notice, even Muhammad Hijab would say this, uh, AP, because we have Muhammad Hijab saying, if you just read the Quran, you get the impression that you can have sex with a five-year-old. But we know from Muhammad, you got to wait a little longer. So what? It, Allah is saying it's permissible. There's no limit. It's permissible sex with a five-year-old. But Muhammad says, no, 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 impermissible. But that's what Muhammad defines as worship. He doesn't, you don't have to be bowing down saying, oh, I worship you. I worship you. I worship you. You're my Lord. If you say, well, God says one thing, you say something else. I'm going to listen to you. That's worshiping the person. And I, no one, no one does this as much as Muslims, as far as taking a merely human being and doing anything he says, just doing absolutely anything he says. I mean, it, what did you say? This is how we have to step into a bathroom? Okay, that's what we'll do. Oh, we have to wipe ourselves in this way? Okay, that's what we have to do. They're taking these as commands of God, and that's what their, that's what their prophet defines as worship. Again, doesn't have to be bowing down saying, we worship you. Simply doing what a human being tells you to do and taking it as a command of God your prophet says that's what worship is, but that's what you do. And that's what Muhammad Hijab does. You guys are all worshiping Muhammad according to Muhammad. Yep, yep, absolutely. Uh, quick update. Somebody uh, sent me a private message uh, to uh, respond to, what I, to, to, to me asking for proof earlier that Muhammad said men and women are equal. Uh, apparently, the hadith is uh, Sunan Abu Dawood 236 is a Hassan hadith, so a good hadith. And in that, Muhammad uh, says when he is asked about uh, whether men, whether 
a woman should be should wash herself or a person should wash her, uh, themselves after having a sexual dream he says bath is not necessary for him and then it is asked uh, what about a woman is it necessary for a woman and she says uh he says yeah uh, women and men are counterparts that's what he says so that's what Muhammad says in the hadith. This is apparently the what is being referenced here as men and women are equal. What I see from this hadith uh, is Muhammad is asked about a very specific uh, case and he says men don't have to wash themselves. And, and then the woman says, is this also for women? And he says, yeah, uh, me, women and women, are, women and men are like each other. Goes for this specific case. I don't see in this in any way a statement saying that men and women are equal before the law or that men and women are in general equal i simply do not see any such thing it no, seems it, to be very far-fetched and misrepresented yeah and <clears throat> any any claim you would have to interpret i mean one of the fundamental rules of interpreting what a person means is comparing it with other things the person has said if you're interpreting it in a way that completely contradicts everything else the person has said, well, you need to rethink. Uh, you need to rethink your position there. So, I mean, if, if you're if you're interpreting some rule about a washing or something like that, and you're saying, "Oh, this is says they're equal," well, if that contradicts everything else the guy says, probably shouldn't be saying that's what it means. Isn't it so funny that he cares so much about context, except when it suits his agenda, right? Very, very funny. Latest book, uh, Pray, you can see it in uh, page 151, where she make, make, makes a series of uh, unsubstantiated claims about Muslim women uh, and their rights in Islam, saying that Jeez. their rights can be sold to strangers and all kinds of nonsense propositions which have no basis in the religion of Islam. So if you really want to know about women, <coughs> and this ultra crepidarian academic charlatan, uh, Ayan, is, is, is just a failure who's who's been uh embro has been let in by the most unusual types of affirmative action program to the neoconservative circles <laughs> what does that have to do with the topic man because she has no academic uh, no, notice uh, notice it, it's it's the same thing it's not hey Jeez. let me answer let me answer you it's discredit the person who's bringing the argument so that no one listens to her and this i mean what in the world does that have to do with the topic i i mean ugh, i don't even know what to say nothing i mean let, let, let me state this more forcefully. Ayan Hirsi Ali could be an axe murderer who slaughtered thousands of people. It would not change the merits of an argument that she's bringing forth. Jeez, this is if so, she's saying, this here's the terrible. argument, the argument is either good or bad. And another, per another person could offer the exact same argument. You might say if someone's like an axe murderer, well, maybe we have to we have to be careful about what the person says to investigate it. But you, you an argument, an art once an argument has been offered, especially you put it in writing, it stands or falls on its on its own merits there. Yeah. What an ultra carpenterian. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I'd, I'd like to just keep the rest of the conversation if we can try to attack the idea rather than the person. Otherwise, I'm never going to be able to have any guests on the show again okay. for opposing views. Okay. Yeah, you're ruining the entire okay. show. Um, I, <laughs> I saw a different stream where she was a guest on someone else's podcast, and she basically, th that, that was after this episode, and she basically said that she's kind of concerned about the way things go because people uh, are very angry at each other. I guess she was refer referring to this, and she says, I'm trying to keep it at the topic because... If one side attacks the other personally so much, people will not want to come on this podcast anymore. But here you have Mohammed Hijab, he ruins everything. I have one follow-up question about what you just said, because I think I understand a, a bit, but um, you talked about you talked about that in regards to believers. So what about non-believers? Like how does the kind of, and I'll just be straight up with it, how does the potential misogyny of affect women if they're non-believers or men's relationships, Muslim men's relationships with non-believing women. Muslim, Muslim men's relationship with non-believing women. There is no differential in that <clears throat> as compared to Muslim men's relationship with believing or oh, non-believing men. There's nothing but in the Quran. Or you the raped the men too? <laughs> <laughs> what? Did, yeah. did, you, did everyone catch that? Do, no do you take male thing. slaves and have sex with them? I don't, yeah, I don't know. I think. I think Hajjad just said that he would rape a... <laughs> <laughs> a male captive too that's weird interesting interpretation i mean especially considering that we're talking about a person who obviously and very clearly said uh that 
Yeah. Uh, let's bring this up here. Gonna bring it I up. believe certain anti-Muslim women would wish they lived in the medieval period, a period where if a war was won by the two opposing sides, it was conventional that people could be taken as booty. Some historical accounts actually say some women would dress up for the captor. He uh, finds this very, very yeah, interesting. What, what, one second. Let me let me let me read this. But since he said there's there's no difference between men and men and women, I believe that certain anti-Muslim men would wish they lived in the medieval period, a period where if a war was won by the opposing side, it was conventional that people, uh, men and women, could be taken as booty. Some historical accounts actually say that some men would dress up for the captor. And There you I go. Mean, notice what he's saying here. He's, he, ladies and gentlemen, if, you're, if you don't understand what he's saying in the, the context of his attacks, uh, he's saying that deep down a lot of these Western women want people like him to come and uh, and uh, kill their husbands and and rape them and these women are going to actually dress up when people like hijab come to town because he's so tough and manly but based on what oh, hijab God. is saying now they do the exact same thing uh, to a nine-year-old boy let me tell you something here Mama Tijab is talking to Michaela Peterson, a free Western woman who can have her mm -hmm. own opinions and possibly say, uh, you know what, I'm, I'm, I have a really bad impression of Islam now. I think I really dislike this religion. This is terrible. Uh, in that case, this, these words that Western anti-Muslim women just want to be captured by strong Muslim men like himself and be raped would also apply to somebody like her, for example. But here he comes on and, uh, you know, has conversations with her and uh, gives these impressions. I mean, it's, it's just, I don't even know what to say. It's, <laughs> this is why I want to keep putting those words that he said out there. So that they stick and that he carries them with him wherever he goes so that people like the petersons can also see what he actually is and what he really thinks and i'm very happy that he's helping us out with that a lot oh, he's helping us <laughs> yeah that indicates that there should be any different way as a general to how men treat non-muslim women to men except for those things which are outlawed by islam itself for example having intercourse before marriage or um, being alone in a place with a woman. Now that can be a Muslim woman or a Muslim or a non-Muslim woman. These are things Islam prohibits because it creates instability in families. It creates no sex before marriage. <laughs> uh, Did he say yeah. that? Did he say yeah. Islam doesn't allow sex before marriage? Yeah. Did, did he, uh, I mean, is he completely ignoring the whole uh, uh, taking women as your captives and and? Let's not talk about that. Let's not talk um, about that. No. <laughs> and so on. The, 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 the thesis, and I'm not sure if you want to ask this as a separate question, but the thesis that McGann has put forward oh, in her newest book, Prey, is that actually what you find is that Muslim men, the immigration of Muslim men to European countries has increased rape. This is basically it. And she mentions in page 33 of that book, she says there's an actual causal relationship. She says that there's a causal relationship. I've read her book, the entire book. And I've seen the data that she puts forward for the claims that she makes, Michaela. And she, um, just go for the idea. The idea is that Muslim men immigration coming into European countries causes an increase in rape. That's what he's cheating. Mm -hmm. Now, look, she mentions, what is the data that she mentioned? She mentions data from about five European countries, including but not limited to the United Kingdom, France, and Sweden. Now, what she then states is that there's evidence for a causal relationship in page 33. What is this data missing? Michaela, this data is missing. I mean, this data has everything going for it, in fact, except for the evidence. Because this data does not even have that these men are Muslim men. And that might be a surprise and a shock to you. But this data is about where these men come from. So for instance, she cites that these men come from Africa, from uh, subcontinental Asia. But you will know, and I'm sure your viewers who are clever people, who have been educated at a minor level, will know that Africa is not a, is not a Muslim continent. I, I, I remember um, Majid Nawaz was asked, uh, he was given a similar objection about this whole thing because he was basically saying that there is a you know uh cause effect relationship between um the increase of muslim um you know a, a muslim population or muslim youth and and rape in the uk and then he was confronted about this like how do you know these are muslims and then he actually presented a lot of data which shows that uh these are you know, the, the data is generalized as coming from these countries or you know south asians and then uh when you actually look at uh the names of known cases you see that the vast majority of them come from a muslim background so um 
and, and, and I'm sure there's a lot of evidence attached to this. I haven't uh, personally uh, prepare, prepared any reports to uh, to put this forward. But what's funny is that he basically agrees with the rise of rape, but he has a problem with, uh, you know, attaching this to 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 Islam as a cause. Uh, y- years ago, I made a I made a video um, about the grooming gangs. And. I was just reading some some articles on the people, and one of the most striking features was how many of them were named Muhammad. Mm-hmm. How many people in the grooming gangs are named Muhammad? So, uh, if Hijab's position is well, if they're immigrants, you don't really you don't know what their religion is. Well, I mean, I don't know exactly what the percentage is, but if uh, if uh, twenty, let's say twenty five percent of them are named Muhammad, <laughs> and like another ten percent are Ali, and another fifteen percent. Or, uh, or Abdullah and so on, um, I think you can start to get an idea of the religious background of these people. He, he, here is the thing. Even if you mention that, they will say, how do you know that Muhammad is actually a Muslim? So. <laughs> oh, that, now, now keep in mind, that could be that could be true. But, you, I mean, you see pictures of these guys going to court. Alhamdulillah, we're here for our court. It's like and they don't seem to be atheists who just happen to be named Muhammad. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's mostly uh, atheists named Muhammad anyway. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there, there was a comment that I saw that I wanted to quickly bring up because I found that that was uh, something that I wanted to add here. But, oh yeah, Lindsay said, uh, extreme sexual repression equals sexual deviance. This is something that Mohammed Hijab will bring up as well, that there is no proof that this is the case. I'm sorry, but there is enough proof. I went to a psychology class where I had this directly in my textbook. Uh there is a there is a lot of research uh, on this on the cultural backgrounds and causes and implications of uh, sexual frustration and repression and how you know uh, uh, sexual um, sexual frustration increases sexual assault and so on and there is a whole sociological term on this now it's it's taken into all kinds of different directions with the current politics but rape culture is something that is actually uh, a, a legitimate topic in sociology with which. Um, in pop culture, it might look a little bit different, but in sociology, it's it's deeply uh, handled, and t- different cultures are analyzed, and uh, it is identified that that if in a culture, women are mostly treated as lesser and objectified and uh, hidden away, and so on, and sex is treated as a taboo, taboo, then you will see an increase of sexual assault and violence toward women. This is this is a, this is an established field in sociology you can't argue that there is no correlation or causation the entire continent of africa there are many muslims in it and there are many christians in it so the data is not conclusive in fact it doesn't even show anything it just shows that people coming from africa there's an increase of people coming from africa and then there's an uh, an increase also in rape okay well we tried the same methodology michaela I actually tried the same methodology with latin america and america the united states of america so people coming from latin america which are not muslims as you know and when they go into America, the United States, there is also a correlative increase in rape. Now, we can't say just because there's a correlative increase in rape, and this is a fallacy, by the way, that therefore the causation is those people. But even if we did say that, well, Latin Americans are not Muslim. Latin Americans are Christians. And therefore, the most part, very small Muslim minority, very, very small and negligible Muslim minority. And therefore, the whole thesis collapses. She even mentions, and she lies through omission by mentioning data from the World Health Organization. And she is a liar, by the way. She's a liar. She lied to the Dutch parliament. She lies by, <laughs> by omission, by mentioning the WHO, the only I know, the only data that has, uh, that the WHO has done on rape. And she, she mentioned certain things about Africa, once again, it's not even a Muslim continent in its entirety, and subcontinent Asia. I find it so funny that he accuses others of being fallacious. <laughs> I mean, please, man. Yeah. Can we get through one minute without seeing a fallacy from him, and then he comes here and accuses others of, of using fallacies? It's so, so funny. Oh, she doesn't mention is that according to the WHO, that same report that she mentions, but she omits this part, part, according to the WHO, that stranger rape is highest in what they call the high-income areas, which is the West. So in other words, stranger rape is highest in Europe, or if you want to generalize, Europe and America. Funny. Take Pakistan. I know for a fact, and you can look this up, and I would like to uh, maybe bring in some evidence, actually. But Pakistan is, for example, a country that is known as a country that has a very big rape problem, but a country in which rape is also uh, 
infamously underreported. Mm -hmm. And you know why? Uh, I do. Please explain. Please enlighten us. Uh, and you see this in other Muslim countries as well. You go in, you go in and say, hey, police officer, I'm a woman and I got raped. And they say, uh, oh, yeah, who raped you? You say, that guy over there. Oh, okay. Let's go ask him. Hey, did you rape her? No, she's a liar. Okay, well, you're free to go because uh, she didn't have enough witnesses to uh, prove that she's been raped. But, ma'am, you just admitted that you had sex, so you're the one who's actually in trouble now. And then what happens is that this, the news that uh, this woman got raped or had sex with a stranger goes out to the relatives mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the, the siblings and the parents of this and woman. She has to die. And then she gets in trouble and is possibly shot or stoned or attacked in different ways because the family cannot take the burden of the, uh, you know, the, 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 the dirt that was placed on their honor because their daughter said that she was in a sexual interaction. In, uh, yeah, and, and 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 not, notice, I mean, notice because even in the West, even in places like the United States and Europe, there are lots of women who don't report rapes, right? Mm -hmm. Like, to, like, okay, it's like I've already been raped, but why do I want to? Do I want to go to court over this and uh, and have to relive this over and over again? And all this stuff. Lots of women don't report it, even though, even though they could and there would be an investigation and if there's if there's proof then a guy could be convicted a lot of women just don't want to go through that that's here that's here where women will be will be protected if if if, if uh if if there's actually evidence and so on to convict a person he can actually be convicted in a different country where hey you go and report this and your life is over and oh but they have lower lower rape rates but notice what it does. It actually protects rapists, and then you get a bigger problem. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and these these are things in Muslim culture where you are supposed to keep this stuff private. You're not supposed to talk about this because you don't talk publicly about about sex, and you also don't publicly talk about um, the fact that you were just raped by somebody. Mm -hmm. This is not something that you go to your to to authorities or to parents with. You keep that to yourself or you try to resolve it uh within because otherwise you will have uh you know a, a filthy reputation and you have put mud on everyone's mind and on your reputation and your honor and your entire family and this and that so and I'm, and and so, if, if you were if you were raped well you were probably i mean this is the attitude you're probably doing something that you weren't supposed to do and it's probably your fault for yeah, yeah. Uh, for inciting the guy and uh why, not, why were you being, out? Not, being, not being covered in a certain way and yeah why were you outside? Why, why, why were you walking like that? Why were you on the bus? Why, why did you go to the store? Yeah. And so, so kind of, lower, less reporting, and therefore, uh, it's worse in the West. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what, a, what a nut, man. Yeah. So, so wait a minute. What's going on here? The whole thesis starts to be destroyed. And of yeah. course, as I've said to you before, and I'll say to you again, Islam prohibits premarital, premarital uh, engagements between men and women. How on earth? That's a lie. That's a lie. That's, That's definitely a lie. A lie. What about what about your female slaves that you yeah, have so, rightfully taken from your opponents? Yeah, he just uh, he just condemned his own prophet who yeah. uh, who had a sex slave named Mary the cop. He eventually married her because he got her pregnant. But uh, I mean, it's in the Quran over and over. It's in the Hadith over and over and over. You conquer people. You take uh, you take you have those women whom your right hands possess, and you're allowed to have sex with them. Well, Muhammad was not a real Muslim, so that's also. You Can you get through. a thesis that says Islam, and she mentions the, the word condemns Muhammad. Policy, causes an increase in rape for Muslim men to non-Muslim women, where Islam limits it to the highest level. Stranger rape, funny enough, according to the WHO, is lowest in areas which are most populated by Muslim people. This is so funny. This has, this has nothing to do with the topic. He's accusing her of, of, of committing a fallacy, and then he says Islam actually uh, prohibits uh, you know, sexual uh, intercourse uh, unmarried and puts it at the highest uh, level. So therefore... I guess it can't really be true that Islam causes uh, a, an increase or that Muslim populations cause an increase in rape. That makes no sense. That's That makes no sense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like the subcontinental area. And of course, they say that's because of the cultural reasons of a woman coming out and all that kind of thing. That's their analysis, but that's not their data. Mo uh, furthermore, if it was to do with the jurisprudence, then we know that Orthodox Jews have a very similar, if not more strict, way more strict, kind of jurisprudential tradition when it comes to the interaction of men and women. However, I will tell you, Michaela, despite that being the case, we don't see that that is causing any rape within 
Jewish communities or Jewish men doing that to non-Jewish women. She mentions in her one of her interviews that she does, she says that therefore Muslim people need to be made uh, be taught how to be egalitarian. We believe in a complementarian system where there's a managerial hierarchy and the man's at the head of it. We do believe in that. Okay, we're not going to in the households. That's we believe that's the only way we can do it. However, okay, hear that again. The managerial hierarchy and the man's at the head of it. We do believe in that. Okay. Taught how to be egalitarian. We believe in a complementarian system where there's a managerial hierarchy and the man's at the head of it. We do believe in that. Michaela, we're not going to lie to you. Okay. In the households, that's we really that's so at least he didn't lie to her. That's good. <laughs> the only way we can do it. However, she's saying no, let's she's trying to impose a feminist narrative, which you should be opposed to, and your father is already opposed to, which she says that she's trying to uh, that men that are coming in from uh, abroad should now be uh, kind of vetted. What a disgusting approach uh, uh, trying to appeal to uh her her father jordan peterson and his uh views now jordan peterson has for a long time described himself as a classical uh liberal or or what is it in his own terms the uh Eng english liberal liberal or something like that i don't know so uh, a, a classical liberal and recently he i think as far as i've uh followed his changes and in, in thinking and attitude he has begun to describe himself as uh partially conservative uh he does believe that people are equal he believes in uh, individualism and in individual freedom and he does believe in the equality of men and women yes he does believe that uh you know the the, the nuclear family and gender rules are important but he does believe in the equality and he certainly does not believe uh in the kind of gender rules that Muhammad hijab propagates here it's very funny to me that he constantly appeals to the conservative western or classical liberal western view and to the nuclear family when he does not even believe in such a family he doesn't believe in one man and one woman and then kids he believes in one man possibly four women endless unlimited sex slaves and so on so what are you doing you know yep it by told by being told what by being told that they need to believe in the egalitarian uh, family system now, if that's the case, that's not going to happen with just Muslims. That should also happen with Christians with traditional conservative values, and it can happen with Jews as well. And if that's the case now, she's, this is a kind of corrosive uh, restriction on, on human freedom, which is unusual. It's a creeping in of collectivist discourse, and it's very unusual because in other places she denies that she's a collectivist. In summary, therefore, I will say that the thesis... That is individualism. I don't know what, he, what he's talking about. This is most pathetic, and it's, it's, it is most rejected. It, it cannot be, and it has already been refuted, by the way, by many, many academics. But it, for example, Jill uh, uh, Filipovich, who's recently written a, a comprehensive refutation of this oh, nonsense, that this miserable specimen of an academic charlatan has written forward, and for some reason is being, uh, <laughs> uh, is being uh, taken seriously by people. But it cannot be taken seriously by people. This is basically, let me show you something, Michaela, since you're on the topic. It's basically a rehashing of, uh, it's oh, a rehashing oh, yeah. of the Look Jewish discourses. Do. As you can see here, the fascistic Jewish, the Jewish problem. You see the white woman there and then the Jewish man. Can you see this kind of thing? Can you see it? I'm not sure if you can see that. This is the kind of thing before. Uh, can, I'm not sure if you can see that or not. A little bit closer would probably be better. Can you put that a bit closer? This so you, but this is the kind of newspaper article. Yeah, yeah. Where the Jewish hey, got down there. As the prize. <laughs> all the people, some great. And they bring it back a bit. Bring it back. Bring it, yeah. 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 Can you see it? Wait. Step forward a bit. This like is that. so ridiculous. Yeah, down a little bit. And the Jewish man on the side. This is before what happened, the pogroms and whatever happened. This is the discourse. She's just, she's just rehashing a, fa a fascistic discourse. So because Ayan Hirsi Ali is proposing that within Muslim culture and within Islam, there is a severely, uh, severely patriarchal abusive system toward women and that they should, uh, you know, learn and benefit from the egalitarian, uh, you know, ideas in the West, he is equating that to uh, cartoons, propaganda cartoons made back in the day in order to, uh, you know, vilify and demonize uh, and dehumanize Jews. I on Hersey Ali, you're basically calling for a Holocaust. You're basically Hitler. I mean, it, it's, I mean, it, it's amazing. It's, hey, hijab, your religion says that you get to beat women into submission, that you get multiple wives and, you know, unlimited sex slaves and you know you can i mean you could beat women until their skin turns green according to their prophet and you can take you you go around conquering and taking these captives and women are are intellectually inferior they're morally inferior and so on you've got all these is this misogynistic well, let me show you this picture to respond to what <laughs> Hersey Ali said uh -huh, look at this is you Jewish you see the pogroms are. it's like dude and what are and, and what are his fans doing yes Alhamdulillah yes, he's, good destroying, job. he's destroying the unbelievers in the name of Allah 
It's so ridiculous. I want to go through a very question. Uh, okay, so things. this is what I've learned, and I don't know whether it's true or not because I don't know what's true exactly out there with all the misinformation about everything. Um, but this is what I've heard that concerns me. And it's that, and, and this argument I think makes sense. It's that when there's an influx of Muslim people to certain European countries and culture starts changing in those areas, um, things like, is like, for instance, is this true in Islam that women who are supposed to have a guardian, a male guardian, is that your question? Yeah, is that true? Just so, so I know, to continue purpose, my question. Like, so there is something called a welly in Islam. The welly is a male guardian in certain very restricted contexts. So for example, if a woman travels and it's a long distance, some scholars say she doesn't need anybody to accompany her. Some scholars say that she should have someone accompanying her. If you were to travel, Michaela, I'm sorry to put it to you, but someone like yourself, and you had a security guard with you, okay, I don't think that's, that diminishes from your independence or your volitional uh, acumen or who you are as a person. I think that just it's a good precaution to have. So it's a right that a Muslim woman has rather than... It's a right. Something which diminishes her value. It's a right. So first off, why don't you just say yes? Why don't you just say yes, there is a guardian system in place? Why do you have to dance around it to get to the point? Why do you have to use so many words to you know, try to make it nice when in the end you're going to say something horrible? and describe it as something nice. Just say yes, say yes, Islam has a guardian system. You need a guardian in order to travel. And this is what I, Muhammad Hijab, believe in. But I also believe that this is not a restriction, no, on the contrary, this is actually a right. This is a favor done to you women because you need to be protected by strong men like us. And, I mean, and, and, while, and while we're on the topic of rights, if you disobey me and I'm your husband, you have the right to get your face smashed in by me. And by the way, the charlatan ultra crepidarian Ayan Hirsi Ali. I, seriously, he's saying uh, it is not it, it is not a restriction. It's actually a right. It's actually in favor of women. I mean, this is such a dumb argument. It's like it's like saying, hey, you know, yeah, I, I want to. Uh, you are my wife, and I want to look out for your safety. I think if you leave the house by yourself, you could get in trouble. Therefore, I want to attach a collar to your neck, which will shock you whenever you take a step outside the house so that you can never leave the house and that, and that you learn to stay inside. And she's like, but but that's a rest but then you're restricting my freedoms. And you're like, no, 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 you don't understand. I'm not restricting you. I'm actually giving you a right because this is in your best interest. This is good for you. I'm just looking out for you. Would you rather be put in danger, in harm's way, or would you rather be protected by me? I'm merely protecting you. This is your right. You should value this, Michaela. Oh, and by, by the way, if you step outside without a male escort, we'll all regard you as a as a whore who's basically begging to be raped. Oh yeah, pretty pretty much, pretty much. Mm -hmm. So yeah, don't step out, or the color will shock you. I'm, ju I'm, I'm just saying that because that is, that is how uh, someone would be viewed in uh, in certain countries. It's uh, yeah. oh, yeah. you're walking outside without the male escort. Uh oh, we all know what that means. Yeah, yeah, but this is just your right. It's just Why? Because, looking out for you. You know, people who are important require uh, protection, and for us, we believe that Muslim women are very important. So in that kind of context, <laughs> and in the context of marriage, for example, if a Muslim woman wanted to get married, some scholars say. The majority of them say that the, the the guardian should get involved in the process. I think Muslims are very important, and I really value Muslims. Uh, and I know that if Muslims are you know talk too much in the public sphere, they might put uh, themselves in danger and tarnish their image and tarnish the image of uh, their own religion, as Muhammad Hijab does here. Therefore, because I value Muslims so much, and because I want to look out for their own benefit and safety, I think Muslims shouldn't be allowed to uh, speak on to speak in the public in public but of course this just means that i'm looking out for the uh, you know for the benefit of muslims this is basically the logic here and it's a job <laughs> i should also add that some say they don't so there's a difference of opinion here but these are the two from my mind, religion was clear restricted context <laughs> which guardianship applies apart from that no okay okay good that answers part of it then and the next one would be like why is it that in some areas um, women are required to like completely cover their bodies, or in some areas, it's you know their faces are are open. okay. Okay, okay. Uh, I want to get through some. Very, very, I, I want to get through a few things. There's there are some uh, very nice parts here that I quickly want to get through. We you just got to do a part two, man, and then a part yeah. three. Yeah. Something else, if you want to add, if I want to add this as well, in the Islamic tradition, something called ghira, which which means a man's protective jealousy over a woman. So, for example, if I you know if a Muslim man married a a, a woman. They should feel they should feel uncomfortable, okay. And this is the Islamic understanding. They should feel uncomfortable at the fact that other men are looking at her in a sexual manner. 
They should feel uncomfortable with that. Why? Because they should feel as if that's their job to satisfy sexually and otherwise that woman. And so for other men to be feasting that's my job. on another woman like that, it's something we feel. The uncovered, the, other, the uncovered meat. Look, you put a lollipop, you take the wrapper off and put it on some ants. The, the ants are going to eat the lollipop. But if you put the wrapper around the lollipop, there are no ants. You see? And this is a perfect representation. He's talking to a woman here uh, who is in public. And he says to her, uh, well, we men, we, you know, it's it's my job to sexually satisfy uh, my woman, to satisfy women. It's 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 the men's job to sexually satisfy the women. And uh, if, if our women go out and others can see them, we just, we don't want that. We don't like that. We hate I, I would, that because we I can't stand impotent. the fact that people feast on our women. <laughs> others should not feast on our women. Only we feast on our women. Only we eat them. Only we lick them. <laughs> my feast. It's my feast. All ah. these women are a feast for me. It's a buffet. Yeah. <laughs> a buffet <laughs> disposition of a man are something which actually creates problems later down the line because well the woman is going to uh, do certain things and the man's going to do certain things in a family and it's going to cause these uh, unstable families really and so this is a way by which and through which stabilities of what a, what a slippery slope we need stability <laughs> we have to wrap our women up and that the muslim people can what a, what a keep their honor slope, and in addition to keeping away from distractions, which will otherwise impede uh, judgments. Uh, yeah, so let us feast on our women. They are exposed to the modern world, I think, in ways that past generations were not. That's having huge impacts on uh, young Muslim people as well. And I think it takes them to a place of at least agnosticism, if not outright atheism. Okay, that makes sense. Is Islam slowly taking over Europe? Well, here, here's the thing, uh, Michaela. Islam has always been part of Europe. We have to see that, first of all, the Renaissance, according to almost every historian of science um, that spoke, if, spoke about this issue, like, for example, Patricia Farah and uh, David Limburg. But in addition to even Orientalists like Thomas uh, Arnold, who, who wrote The Preaching of Islam, he's an Orientalist. And all those people see that actually the Islamic influence has caused... The, or was a trigger at least to the renaissance and not only that i mean you have to remember something like this computer that we're looking at each other with right now and this <coughs> all of that was the influence of islamic science for example ibn al-haytham who whose theory on optics was carried over to the west and therefore through it we could develop things like cameras so oh my so goodness <laughs> Oh my God! I, Look, I, he go got ahead. this. I got the book. It's called uh, "A Thousand and One uh, Inventions" and so on. Um, they say that yeah, this this guy invented. He invented the camera. Uh, sorry, what's called the camera obscura existed all the way back during the time of Aristotle. What he did was compare the eye to a camera. That's it. And so since he said something to, since he had something to do with something, now keep in mind, I mean, that, that, that is important. You know, you, you've got, hey, a, a camera is very, is similar to an eye. Therefore, you see, he gave the knowledge to invent the camera. They do this with everything, right? I mean, the, the Egyptians did geometry. The Greeks did geometry. The Indians did, ge I mean, uh, uh, algebra, right? Uh, so Egyptians did algebra. Greeks did algebra. Indians did algebra. Uh, Chinese did algebra, the Babylonians did algebra, they all did algebra. But you you also had Muslims who did algebra. So what? how do they describe that? You see, Muslims invented algebra. It's like, hey, we had someone who made a slight contribution here. Therefore, we invented it. It's all because of Islam. And uh, what was your role in the Renaissance? Well, we had some, we had the works in areas we conquered. In areas we conquered, we had some works from the Greek philosophers that were preserved by other people. And since we conquer those areas, we had them. And then Europeans start to get access. You see, it's Islam. It's not, it's not Islam. If you just have something that someone else had. So people who were conquered by the Muslims and became part of the Muslim society took things over, which Europeans before them and others before them, including Indians, developed. They took these things over and expanded on them, developed them further, and then gave these records uh, through cultural in interactions to the West. And then over many centuries, uh, things developed. And you know what? This is all uh, Islam's doing. This and no, notice this this would be like Muhammad. This would be like Muhammad, this would be exactly the same things if Muhammad Hijab said, Oh, and we conquered Europe. I mean, we conquered Egypt. And so you see, Muslims built the pyramids. 
Like, wait, what? <laughs> yeah, we, we conquered the area where they had the pyramids so that we we built them. That was, you see? Wonders so, of the ancient world. We made them. You didn't make you didn't make them. Oh, but we conquered the area, so it's ours. It's like <laughs> so th th there are there are a few things that need to be said. There were a lot of contributions in uh that's true in, in a few centuries within muslim uh realms mm -hmm. by uh people who were identified as muslims and th they came from cultures which which are within the muslim empires who did some great contributions to different different fields of yeah. science medicine undeniable engineering medicine engineering inventing various things uh and uh also also in philosophy but notice yeah. it it never lasts in Islam, right? It just never yeah. lasts. They, they conquer an area, they get some stuff, there'll be a brief flourishing of it, and then Islam will just suffocate it until until it's done. Yeah, right? yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, there is an what else? There's one more thing that I want to kind of get to. Uh, influence of Islam and always has been an influence of honest, uh, um, of Islam onto Europe. Through conquest. And some, yes. there are only 5% of people in Europe that are Muslim. Yeah, okay, whatever. Does the salute. You might have heard of him. Killed 77 liberal non-Muslim people. Okay. He is talking about uh, the guy, Breivik, who killed uh, mm -hmm. a bunch of uh, young people in Norway. Mm -hmm. And because in his uh, long 1,000-page testimony, Ayana Hirsi Ali was also mentioned, he basically says that Ayana Hirsi Ali was responsible for uh, that guy killing people. Uh, uh, at, oh, but by the way, uh, yeah, I forget what is what it was something like a thousand or fifteen hundred pages and so on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I read, I, yeah. I read that thing. There were a bunch of things that were like recipes and like lists of things and stuff like that that I didn't read. But as far as the, his thinking process, I read all of that stuff. And really? actually, 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 it's completely different. What what Breivik said was growing up in the eighties around. Muslims, he started noticing, um, you know, people getting beaten up and so on. So, so, you know, with a guy like that, I'm not sure what to take seriously in what he's saying, but this is his description of it. So he starts knowing, he starts seeing these problems. Then he starts deciding that he needs to figure out why you have these problems. So he says that in the 90s, he goes to the Muslim sources, the Quran and the Hadith, and sees where these problems arise. Then he decides that he's going to go into politics. He's going to go in politics to do something about this. Then he realized that if you go into politics and you disagree at all with Islam, you'll just be shouted down as a racist and a bigot. So he had to decide how to get his message out there. And he said he realized it from Al-Qaeda that the way to break through the control of governments and politicians and media on what people can say and how to get their message across. In order to break through that, you have to do what he called deadly shock attacks. You have to do something so shocking that everyone suddenly pays attention to you. So mm -hmm. he decided he's going to go on a killing spree because that's going to make people pay attention to him. And what did they do? Everyone went and looked at his at his manifesto to see what is making this guy uh, do this horrible thing. So notice what he's saying. Where did he get the idea to do this attack? Well, uh, he's bothered by Islam, then he's bothered by the Muslim sources, and then he learns, oh, if I want to get my message across, uh, I need to do what Al-Qaeda does. Where's he getting it? At no point does he say, and then I realized from my Hirsi Ali and what she said about Teo Van Gogh being killed, that I need to go and slaughter a bunch of non-Muslim <laughs> non teenagers. That's what he did, right? He didn't go. He didn't, he didn't go. He didn't go shoot up a mosque like that, like that guy in in New Zealand. He went and shot up a bunch of non-Muslims because he thought that would be more impactful on people. That would be more horrifying to people, so that he could get his message across. So, just to be clear, Anders Breivik, uh, he is a an Odinist. Uh, I think neo-Nazi, definitely white supremacist. He sounds he sounds at least partly insane horrible person, did horrible things, despicable, should be looked upon with complete contempt. But with all that said, for someone like Hijab to say, aha, because uh, he, because he quoted Ayan Hirsi Ali. Yeah. And he quoted, uh, I mean, he quoted uh, various presidents. He quoted Darwin. He quoted philosophers and so on. You could just pay, pick anyone you don't like, find where he quotes that person. Um Therefore, she's responsible when if you look at what he actually said, if you want to say who, in, who inspired him to go on a killing spree, 
it's politicians and them and them shutting down people's ability to convey their concerns and Al Qaeda. Yep. That's where I got it from. It's very funny. Um, he's on the, on the same path. Uh, he does basically the same thing that Ali Dawa tried to do with me when I didn't even have anything to do with uh, any of these people. And I never, ever approved of violence or of any such rhetoric. He tried to say that I am basically responsible for that guy shooting up uh, a mosque in, in New Zealand. That's basically what Ali Dawa said during our stream, mm -hmm. uh, which is very funny. I, I immediately pointed out the the, the the irony here because I have always spoken against violence and mm -hmm. against hating people whereas Ali Dawa himself has openly said that he believes people like me should be executed and that we are worthless animals mm -hmm. but he thinks I inspire hate and killings and he doesn't and here in this case we have the same thing again yeah yep and uh <laughs> it's it's just it's just horrible and uh, you Muslims who are watching right you Muslims who are watching um if you if you celebrate this right if you say hey this guy does nothing but misrepresent and twist and distort things and the entire time he's accusing ian hersi ali of misrepresenting and distorting things and that's why you shouldn't listen and he's not answering the question not not explaining anything that he's supposed to explain and acting like a, a deranged jerk the entire time and you say hey that's our guy you you deserve the you deserve the avalanche of apostasy that is upon You're you right now dumbass uh, millions yeah. of Christian people in this country. Why? Because Christianity has not stood the test of time. Um, <laughs> the narratives in Genesis, I remember even reading your dad's book, The Maps of Meaning, and he, he had some doubts about Christianity by just reading the Genesis narrative, because the Genesis narrative is very much out of touch with anything that could be considered scientific. <laughs> and, and that's another reason, the Trinity, the, the slavish morality, the lack of structure in that religion. And so on and so forth and so forth. So people are leaving Christianity, which is another reason why Islam is the fastest growing uh, religion. It's so, birth rates. <laughs> it, it is, yeah, yeah. It's it's very funny. He knows that he knows very well that Islam's growth rate is to ninety nine point seven percent due to birth rates. Is that that is the clear data here? There is no mass conversion to Islam. People are not convinced by by the greatness and beauty and uh, you know logic and reason of Islam. They are not converting to Islam. People, Muslims are simply giving birth much more, which is if you look at the data and, of, of of stuff like uh, the Great Divergence, for example, it was put forth that uh, birth rates in underdeveloped cultures are. Uh, because birth rates grow exponentially in food uh, and other, uh, you know, resources uh, are put out uh, not in the same way, but in a steady way, higher birth rates are actually not a good thing. It's it's, it's bad for the well-being of your culture. And we and, see that in the Muslim cultures. And this is the guy screaming at people at Speaker's Corner, your child's going to become an apostate! Your child's going to become <laughs> an apostate! Muslim youth are leaving Islam! And his guy... And Ali Dawa, same thing. Help me, help me. Right? They literally say it with this tape on it. Help me, help me. Muslim youth are, are getting the answers to the questions and they're leaving Islam. And so he knows it's crumbling from within. And yet, ah, oh, you see, but, you know, people are recognizing that it's it's the truth and it's standing the test of time because of high birth rates, because that's one of the features of third world countries is they tend to have significantly higher uh, birth rates. And if you it, it, notice, it, even in places like Europe and other places, wherever Islam is, they have the highest, they have the highest birth rates. And you can tell because of the teachings of Muhammad, it's basically, Hey, uh, your job in life is to be, <laughs> is, to, is to be a baby making machine. Uh, it's not just to be clear, not always the case. There are some people who, uh, who uh, have a much higher view of, of women than that, but it's, it's Make a babies. much, it's a much bigger, it's a much bigger thing in Make Islam babies. than it is elsewhere. And, and guess what? If you're, if your goal is to marry off uh, girls when they're young so that Make they babies. never have an opportunity to cheat and so on. Well, th they end up having Make eight, babies. 10, 12 kids and so on. You know, by the way, the, the other Muhammad also said that you should uh, multiply a lot, and that that he uh, in, in the on the day of judgment he will be proud of the number of his of his followers. So. The, the the other the other funny thing there was he he just attacked Genesis when his prophet affirmed the inspiration, preservation, and authority of the Torah. He even had the Jews bring him a copy of the Torah, and he said, "I believe in you and in the one who revealed you." And Ajab saying, "Ajab said, no, don't believe in that book." Oh. So and great. he talks your about your prophet, science. Your prophets, your pro, uh, hijab just called his God and his prophet total morons, and and he knows better than his his God and his prophet. And you know what? 
we're proud of that. Yes. Slavish, like um, forgiveness? <laughs> no, uh, I don't. <laughs> you mean slavish, like um, forgiveness? No, uh, I don't. Well, this is a quote from Nietzsche. Nietzsche, uh, uh, who? <laughs> uh, interest. No, uh, I don't. Well, this is a quote from Nietzsche. Nietzsche. Nietzsche? Who is Nietzsche? Is, is, am I hearing this wrong? Is, this, is, it a, is it an accent thing? What's going on here? No, uh, I don't. Well, this is a quote from Nietzsche. Nietzsche. Uh, it, it's, it's Nietzsche. Okay. It's, it's Nietzsche. This is, it's not Nietzsche. I don't know. Man, let him make his quote. I want to hear what he's saying that right. Nietzsche said. He actually had an interesting sound of Christianity. The fact that you get hit or attacked or uh, oppressed and that uh, you don't actually respond. This is almost verging on a pacifistic notion. This kind of thing is, we believe is, well, Nietzsche believed it was a slavish morality. It was slavish. It was like a slave. That's yeah. how a slave is treated. Whereas Islam, it doesn't say anything like that at all. It says that if you are dealt with in a certain way, you know, by the way, which is that, that, that the recompense of a sin, so if someone is to harm you in a certain way, is that you harm them in exactly the same way. But whoever is forgiving, whoever is pardoning and forgiving, then there, the reward will be with God. But sometimes, Michaela, and you know this. Okay, here, here's the thing. You know, I uh, like Nietzsche. You know, I'm kind of a, I'm kind of a fan of I Nietzsche. I like certain things about Nietzsche. He, I, I, I simply do not understand why he appeals to Nietzsche right now. And I simply do not understand why he appeals to Nietzsche's uh, description of religion or as, uh, for, as Abrahamic religion or Jewish religion as slave morality. It's true. Nietzsche said that Judaism and Christianity arose from a resentment within uh, op the oppressed people who turned bad into good and good into bad, and then thereby established a you know uh, a, 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 a a form of morality where being weak is seen as good and being strong is seen as bad, and and so on. So this is basically a very brief uh, description of what Nietzsche actually said about slave morality and Christianity and Judaism. The issue is I don't understand why he brings this up because read uh, Nietzsche's book uh, Twilight of the Idols he also uh, lengthily complains about the dichotomy of good and evil and basically s describes this as a whole as a as a barrier in the you know in, in, the, in the human development and intellect and freedom of the of the of the free thinking free spirit and specifically he talks about destroying dogma and destroying restrictions and morals put upon humans by such uh you know ancient systems where they do not belong in, in our nature i don't understand why in this case he brings up nietzsche as an argument against christianity because yeah. yeah. nietzsche would also say you know what islam is ultimate nonsense and it is an idol that we should break this is what nietzsche would say and uh, if i were to respond to nietzsche <laughs> The way Muhammad Hijab would. <laughs> Wait, you acting like you're strong and powerful in your writings, but look at you. You are frail and weak, and you couldn't even make it in the military because you fell off your horse, and you're all frail and weak, and then you eventually go crazy, and you couldn't handle a woman, and you got disrespected by them. You see this? You see, you're a pathetic individual. You're a pathetic man. You're pathetic. We shouldn't listen to anything you say. That's how you would respond to someone like Nietzsche if you were, yeah, if you were disagreeing yeah. with Nietzsche. But notice what, I mean, what, what Nietzsche, what Nietzsche is a weakling. Yeah, he's a weakling. He's a weakling. I mean, you saw you saw a guy beating his horse, and you go crazy over it. Come on, man. Come on, are you serious? <laughs> uh, uh, as far as far as uh, as far as something like that, it's really the pattern that we see everywhere. It's hey, if if I can if I can take something, if I can take something out of this and pretend that it agrees with me and agrees with Islam, then I'm going to do it. Right? That's exactly what Muhammad did with these. Uh, you know, your interview with Bart Ehrman with these uh, these apocryphal sources and so on. Hey, if I can take something, if I can steal something from there and use it for Islam, uh, that's what I'll do. Or the same thing that Islam does with with uh, science and the Quran. Hey, if I if I can find some random verse here and, and, and I can find something from science and make it sound like it agrees, I'll do that. Even if, you know, the actual verse or the actual scientific principle completely contradict or are completely contradictory. Um, but the same thing here. Hey, here's here's something I'll quote Nietzsche. In the same way that I used the word ultra crepidarian uh, to sound like I know what I'm talking about and that I'm saying something coherent and meaningful here. 
Um, I mean, notice all, all he had to say was, hey, there's something weird about the idea that you should turn the other cheek if someone strikes you on one cheek. There's something weird about that. And then, you know, the response would be, well, let us explain what that means. Um, but it's not. It's let me say something that I can say in five seconds. Hey, uh, we don't believe that you turn the other cheek if someone someone strikes you on one cheek. Uh, and so, you know, we're, we're going to give you a crack back. And so we have a, a psychologically healthier system or something like that. That's yeah. it. It's going to be done. But, you know, it was was it was it not a was it not a Copernicus who brought up the scientific principle of uh, <laughs> this uh, Newton and uh, you know, yeah. action and reaction? Yeah. Oh, it's, dude. Nietzsche would agree with me, although he is an ultra crepidarian weakling. Yeah, yeah, weakling more than anyone else, and so does your father. Sometimes kindness turns into weakness. This is so disgusting. Uh, <laughs> I feel disgusted by his constant appeal to you. you, you I know your father, and uh, And sometimes uh, forgiven, forgiveness is not forgiveness, especially when you do it with someone that will Jeez. harm you again and harm others again. That's why we have prisons. That's why we have. That's why Christianity actually had to act like Islam in order to expand, in order to be what it is. In other words, it had to have a just war theory. It had to have. It didn't have this morality. Theodosius II and Constantine and all of those uh, emperors of Rome didn't decide to be pacifists. They decided to expand their empires, which of course is something that Islam as well did. Okay, here is another part that I want to quickly get to. Uh... Uh, but but by by the by the way, I mean he, he's he's extremely stupid right there about what Christianity even teaches. He says, this is why we have prisons. You know, if, if Christianity were, if it, if it were really Christianity, there would be no prisons because you would just, uh, you just let everyone do everything and never, never stop them. That's ridiculous. Right. The, the, the <laughs> it specifically says governments have the right to punish wrongdoers. And so there's nothing against self-defense in Christianity. Jesus is talking about, uh, a particular situation here. Um, the the slap was was more of an insult than yeah. someone coming to like murder your family and so on. But notice it's governments have the right and the authority to punish wrongdoers according to Christianity. And he's acting like uh, you know we had to act like Islam, and that's why they came up with just war theory. Yeah. They came up with just war theory no, because they were. There were times when you could just do whatever you want. You could go around raping captives and slaughtering people and so on. But Christians recognize, hey, wait a minute. We actually believe that people are creating the image of God and stuff. So this, this should kind of be a last resort. And we should have some rules for how captives are treated. Um, and so they come up with just war theory. Wait a minute. Governments have to deal with problems in the world. And yet we have a certain view of human beings. Therefore, how do we reconcile this? They come up with just war theory. And he thinks that just war theory is is just you know acting like Islam for for purposes of expansion. That's, that's not that's not what just war theory is at all. Such an ultra crepidarian, seriously. And this is in a book which can be read in the English language by Bruce Lawrence, is saying that this is not because of the religion of Islam. It's despite the religion of Islam that we're doing this. It's a logical argument that we're putting forward of symmetrical warfare. We are we are killing them because they are we are killing their civilians because we are killing they are killing our civilians. This is what he is saying. But the Quran very clearly states, Michaela, in chapter sixty, verse eight, لا الله عن الذين لم يقاتلوكم في الدين that God does not uh, forbid you to feel justly with those who do not try and kill you because of your religion. or try and kick you out of your homes and تبروهم. That you're good with them and you're just with them. That's what the Quran says. That God loves the just people. In other words, Islam forbids the killing of innocent civilians. Categorically, the Prophet said, Man qatala Okay, so <laughs> there, here, so, here, here, here is the logic. Some, he's got to be lying. Here's, here's the logic. The Quran says that Allah does not forbid you from being just toward those who didn't oppress you. Therefore, Islam forbids the killing of people. What? How do yep. you get to that? So I don't, I don't, hey, you know, you know what? I don't forbid yep. you from being nice to others. Yep. Therefore, I am forbidding that you are violent to others. This is the logic here. There yep. is, th that's so dumb. Hor horrible, horrible logic. And, and just so uh... incredibly dumb. 
Now, now, so notice he quotes, and th this is why, see, sometimes I wonder, you know, does he actually believe what he's saying? Here, he has to know he's lying. He has to, absolutely, indisputably, 100%. He's studied enough to know that he's lying a bunch right here. Um, so he quotes Surah 60, verse 8. Allah does not forbid you. If someone could, you, you don't have to murder the person, right? Right? So that's Surah 60, <laughs> verse 8. Notice, just, just four verses earlier, Surah 60, verse 4. Indeed, there is for you a good example in Abraham and those with him when they said to their people, surely we are clear of you and what you serve besides Allah. We declare ourselves to be clear of you and enmity and hatred have appeared between us and you forever until you believe in Allah alone. Notice. Because you do not believe in Allah alone, there is enmity and hatred between us forever. And it's saying this is a good example for Muslim. Now, keep in mind, guys, Abraham never said this. This is just Muhammad putting his words into people uh, so that he can spread his own religion. But he's saying, Abraham said, yes, uh, unbelievers, hey, enmity and hate, nothing but enmity and hatred between us until you say, uh, until you believe in only Allah. Even in Surah 60, verse 8, read Tafsir Jalalain. says, abrogated by the commands to fight. Surah 60, verse 8, which Hijab quotes, he knows uh, that according to his own scholars, that has been abrogated by commands to violently subjugate people. And him, notice what he's saying there. Innocent civilians. What do you mean by that? The Quran says, fight those who do not believe. It doesn't, doesn't say just, oh, fight those who do not believe if they're attacking you. Muhammad said what? Um, I've been commanded to fight people until they say there's no God but Allah. You're fighting people based on what they believe. So so according to this, if you walk down the street and you see a, a Christian, you walk down the street, you see a Jew. These are not innocent people, according to the Quran. These are the worst of creatures and they have to be subjugated for their beliefs. I look at this infamous uh, Quran chapter 9, verse 29. It doesn't say uh, that you're not supposed to kill, uh, you know, the non-combatants or civilians or whatever, or that you are only to fight those who are unjust. It says he clearly fight those who do not believe in Allah or in the last day and who do not consider unlawful what Allah and his messenger have made unlawful and who do not adopt the religion of truth from those who were given the scripture until they give the jizya willingly while they are humbled. So this is a categorical declaration of uh, fight those who don't believe in Islam until they agree to become subjects of you. It doesn't say anywhere, fight those who are unjust or fight those who oppress you. No, this is simply fight those who don't believe. But hey, P, you're an ultra crepidarian in an earlier <laughs> verse, in an earlier verse that's been abrogated. You see, you're obsequious to David Wood. That's why. <laughs> My goodness. Well, well, that's... That's... So lies and distortions. Whoever kills a non-combatant, non-believer, they will not smell the fragrance of heaven. When innocent people were False. killed at the time of the Prophet, the Prophet Muhammad himself, he stated that this is something. Look, I, I actually, uh, a Muslim actually responded to this. What he's referring to is uh, a hadith that appears in which he says in which Muhammad is quoted as saying, whoever kills a Muahid will not smell the fragrance of paradise, even though its fragrance may be selected from a distance of, uh, detected from a distance of 40 years. This does not mean non-combatant. What this means is a demi, somebody who is a subject in your Islamic society, a non-Muslim, an unbeliever who is a subject and who pays the jizya because you have sub humiliated them in accordance with uh, Quran chapter 9, verse 29. Mm -hmm. So Muhammad Hijab is either again here lying about this and deliberately misrepresenting what this what this hadith actually says and this was pointed out by a muslim that muhammad hijab is misrepresenting his own religion uh for deception or to you know to 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 be to appear good to the non-muslims or he doesn't understand his own texts nothing here ever says that it is forbidden to kill non-combatant non-muslims yeah i'm thinking lion at this point yeah this is just so disgusting it's just so dirty yeah. pretty bad he said, I am completely disassociated with this person Khalid did, which is killing innocent people. The Sahabi, who was a companion who was new to the religion of Islam, he didn't understand. He said, I'm completely disassociated with it. In other words, Islam is categorical about the killing of civilians, about the killing of innocent people, <laughs> non-combatants and so on. 
Now it's a challenge to people like the hate peddlers, wow. like Ian McGann, the hate wow. peddlers, the individuals who are miserable specimens of academic charlatans that they are, who lie about the religion of Islam, who challenge the references okay, that I've just okay. made. Yeah. <laughs> 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 okay, okay. I was waiting for this moment. Uh, no, notice I, this is. This I find is, that he says individual. Individual is just a person. I don't know why he emphasizes. Yeah, so, so notice this. He, he, I mean, uh, uh, Michaela admittedly <laughs> doesn't know a lot about this, so she, so she's asking, uh, she's asking questions. Uh, most of her viewers probably don't know anything, and Hijab just finally thought, "Hey, now I get to lie all I want." You see, it's categorical. It categorically didn't, no. <laughs> you're just you're you're twisting a you're twisting a couple of passages that have nothing to do it. Even Muslims would refute you, um, and you're ignoring all of the actual clear commands of Allah, which call for the violent subjugation of the entire world. I believe, as far as I remember, she will ask a follow up question to this. But wait, wait a I about the religion of Islam to challenge the reference. Okay. That I've just okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Is it is it possible you say, that they're I mean, you're going to say yes, because like anything's possible. So I should reword that. Okay. Um, couldn't, couldn't people, okay, you specifically said it's against the Quran to hurt innocent people, yes. but if they're believed to not Chapter be innocent, verse. then they could possibly get hurt. And I mean, that goes across all religions, but non-combatants mm -hmm. non-combatants so it's categorically impossible to kill non-combatants it's good of michaela to ask his follow-up question but what does he do in his response he says again it is uh it is completely forbidden to kill non-combatants categorical that's it yeah that's because it says lie because it says in an abrogated verse allah does not forbid you from showing yeah. <laughs> kindness yeah. to someone therefore it is if an apostate, if somebody leaves Islam and openly says that they have left Islam, is this person a uh, a combatant or non-combatant person? Is this person guilty or innocent, for example? And 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 one uh, one um, one important follow up for future reference for everyone who's watching is when someone says uh, and Islam con condemns killing innocent people uh, is a let's say an atheist or a polytheist or a Christian or a Jew who rejects. Muhammad as a prophet is that person innocent according to your religion? Quick follow up. Yeah, yeah. An apostate is not innocent according to the Islamic religion. Yeah, an and and to innocent. dive to dive into the into the Sharia of matters, I should have a book here somewhere. Whatever to the, in, into the into the into the Islamic law, uh, according to the Islamic law agreed by most uh, by by most Islamic scholars. Uh, you, a regular person is not supposed to kill an apostate, for example. It is supposed to be done by the authorities, you know, by, by, by the by the by the orders of the caliph. But if somebody kills an apostate, it doesn't count as murder, for example, because if you if you kill an apostate, then you are merely killing somebody who already deserves to die. But you are merely being vigilant and taking things into your own hands. What you then get as a result of that is not the punishment of somebody who kills a regular innocent person. Uh, the authority can choose to give you a mild punishment because you have only done a little misdemeanor. You could just get away with a warning, for example. That is what is established established in Islamic laws. So you can kill an, a, a person who is an apostate, and that person is not seen as uh, as innocent, and you are not counted as a murderer as a result of that. So please, man, stop lying. But yeah, so we are we are very much uh, we have gone through an hour of this we are uh, the stream is now two hours and 10 minutes long. I think we've gone through a lot. I don't know. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Should we continue with this some other time? Uh, you can ask people if they want it. I mean, I'm sure we covered uh, most of the stuff. Uh, but yeah, I mean, if if you're if you're watching it and you see more that you'd like to cover, uh, I, I think we we could go on with this a different time. But I would I would like to ask uh, viewers, what do you think, everybody? Should we uh, do a part two of this or what? By the way, the poll that I made earlier. Where did it go? I don't know. This system is kind of dumb and crappy. But the poll that I made earlier, I asked, uh, a, uh, what, what do you think? Do most Muslims who see this uh, feel, you know, happy or proud of the way Muhammad Hijab represented uh, Islam? I think 57% said yes. 
<laughs> and the rest, uh, 43% said no. So people, many people think that Muslims are not proud of this. I'm sorry to disappoint you, but let's go into the comment section here. Uh, Mohammed Hijab is here. I would like to thank Michaela for uh, allowing this to happen and so on. Proud of you for putting this together. I mean, you revert to Islam. I was Christian. Yeah, uh, well, alhamdulillah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But before before you look at this comments, uh, this is the uh, this is the pattern um, very common in the communities, especially uh, the followers of people like Hijab and Ali Dawa is to use. They use basically three of the five classic. Uh, styles of manipulation, mm -hmm. um, but it's uh, the it's reward, right? So it's mm -hmm. po positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, and punishment. And uh, what that breaks down to is when you're doing what is useful to us and what we like, we're going to heap praises on you and tell you how wonderful and great you are. When you're doing something we don't like, then we're going to heap insults and abuse on you. And so you're about to go through these comments. I'm guessing, oh, alhamdulillah, oh, you're so wonderful. It's so yeah. great, Michaela, that you've you've had Muhammad Hijab on there because they want, uh, you know, she's she's giving Muhammad Hijab a platform. So anyone who's going to give him a platform is going to be showered with praise. And if you do anything they don't like, suddenly you'll have insults and abuse heaped on you. Yeah. So uh, what, what, what Mohammed Hijab did and what they did all together was uh, to announce in, in, in advance that this podcast will happen and that this will go public. He then announced on what date specifically it will go public. And he specifically said he specifically instructed uh, the Muslim followers to do what they did before meaning to go on this video as soon as it comes out and to uh, leave their comments and to express how how amazing it was and how great it is that a Muslim is, is, is here representing Islam truthfully. And that is what basically happened. As soon as the video was published, within the first seconds, Muslims came here and were like, oh, this is a fantastic conversation. Thank you so much, mm -hmm. Michaela, for making this possible. Alhamdulillah. And then others watched it too and were like, Alhamdulillah, finally the charlatan snake Ayan was uh, uh, ultra crepidarian Ayan was humiliated and destroyed by our uh, by our brother Muhammad Hijab and so on, which went so far that Michaela herself was completely uh, uh, distressed and completely, you know, annoyed by this. That she seemingly shares the view that this was completely uh, that she's freaked out and that this was stressful and this was actually kind of a terrible experience. And we will see more of that, more of her opinions on this whole stuff. But yeah, I'm, I'm sorry to disappoint everybody, but most Muslims who see this actually are proud of this. Maybe they haven't watched the whole thing, but most of them are proud of this. And believe it or not, that is the case. From everything that we have seen, many of you might think, how could people possibly be proud of this? But I'm sorry, that's really how people are. Welcome to Islam. What a religion. <laughs> Good stuff. <laughs> what a religion, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. I guess we can continue next time. Many people say yes, do part two. So that's a good thing to see. <clears throat> I guess we could go on and uh, specifically go into um, parts of this again in a second stream. Uh, we can do that. And how about this, David? Hmm. We Can we make another stream? And uh, in that, we will respond to the super chats because I know, I know you will be very angry with me if, if I now start reading super chats. I will. Uh, I will. I won't murder you, but I'll want to murder you. <laughs> you will basically humiliate me. But uh, just to honor them, I will just quickly read through them without responding to them. Okay. Uh, or just just a few. Okay, thank you so much. Time is fleeting. I, I never debated him. Thank you so much, Michael Mix Saucy. Thank you so much, XXWLZ. Sorry, we couldn't we couldn't really uh, focus on the super chats this time. Are you going on her show, AP? Uh, I will have some updates on that uh, soon. Uh, Hijab stole the world ultra crepidarian from Yasser Qadi. I want to show some support. Let's all leave Islam. Thank you so much. Super sticker. I can't see it here, but thank you. Joel said, hey, David, sorry, this is off topic. Well, I'm sorry. 
uh td with a super chat and said free book downloads on sex women uh and so on arnab mubashir thank you so much for the information muhammad needs his hijab after wearing burqa women are safe from quran 434 another grape hand apollo's christian apologetics uh james is tired said david wood is exposing hijab for the 100th time uh, celebrations pumpkin palmer said uh, POV, you are D David Wood and AP. Islam, no Islam. God bless. Pilgrim said, I know Islam, no peace. No Islam, no peace. The Roaring Man uh, said, what is there for Muslim women in, uh, in heaven? Nothing except being a wife. Hi, David Wood and AP. How are you doing? Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And yes, my debate with uh, Alidawa was a fantastic presentation as well. Jesus loves you, AP said. Jesus saves. Thank you for letting me know. Uh, Rinsler made a super chat and said, the fluffier the bird, the better the Virginia hijab, probably. What? Is that a phrase that I don't know? I don't know. AP or David? Oh, I responded to this. I will look at that. Zagros said, David, why did you block me on Twitter? Chicken. David, why did you block him on Twitter? Chicken. Uh, I block people who, who I, I'm on Twitter. I'm only on Twitter just to be able to, uh, to tell team youtube when they screwed up one of my videos and stuff and so i post stuff there and uh, it's cool people but the people who uh start uh, sending me messages trying to argue with me i'm like go, go somewhere else uh, it's just mixed like ultra not uh ultra carpidarianism david you mentioned in a different okay we read this uh allah loves not the proud and arrogant sorry all ali we are proud of that dawa and muhammad hijab you poor boy <laughs> The Quran also says, by the way, very explicitly that Allah does not love the disbelievers. So that's for everybody to know. Milan is happy about Mohammed Hijab's performance. Well, Milan, uh, no disrespect to her. I think uh, we had a very nice conversation. I will have her back on again very soon. Uh, she is very much in favor of this uh, very strong uh muslim men attitude. So I guess she will kind of like that stuff. But... Uh, it's quite obvious and finally one more super chat here which says hi david wood and ap is there any chance you do a video review on most truthful islamic group like a keen institute uh, uh stuff that we can work on definitely but i think david wood wants to leave us uh he uh, wants to die today i'm ass uh, i'm assuming i'm assuming that's that's uh that's sarcastic because uh <laughs> the akeen institute i saw that i I believe I glanced at an article from the Keen Institute on Muhammad and Aisha, and they actually quoted a hadith that is known to be a flat-out mistranslation. It's the one in Bukhari that says, uh, ever since the time I reached puberty, when that's been exposed over and over and over oh, again. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. It's not, it's not since the time I reached puberty. It's since the, since the age where I can remember things. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was mistranslated as puberty. But then they run with it and say, you see, she reached puberty. And it's, it's, it's totally They have a long article on that. I remember I read part of that article a few years back. I think that's, that's a few years old, right? If that's what, I, what you're talking about. Uh, I think that was yeah. on that site. And so I was, yeah. was not impressed. If I start seeing you quote obvious mistranslations that have been exposed, uh, yeah. not a fan. That means you're an ultra crepidarian and we don't deal with ultra crepidarianism. No, we don't. So, all right. Well, thanks everybody for watching. Thanks everybody for reviewing. Thanks everybody for being here. And David Wood is a chicken, say some people. <laughs> uh, all right. Thanks everybody. David, what do you say? What do you, what do you do? Should we go? Uh, stay away from AP. No, uh, stay away from Islam. Fantastic. Well said. Well said. Well said. I couldn't have said it better myself. I will try nevertheless. Thanks, everybody, for, for watching. I will see you again. We'll probably be back with part two. Have a fantastic night and day and wherever you are. And stay away from Islam. You stole my line. Yeah, I should I should put in that Sajid Lipim oh, that awesome clip. Ver version for the end of my life. Stream. Stay away from Islam. Stay away. It says, stay away from Islam. <laughs> Okay, bye. <laughs>